Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This is S4A live stream number 65 being recorded on November 17, 2022. We have about 15 people in the chat right now, and we're going to go ahead and start today's stream. So today we're going to finish the long article from ProPublica about the rent algorithm that has been raising rents all over the United States. We're going to do uh, some more COVID stuff, and we're going to do some longer articles about organizing the unemployed. i got two of those. So that's pretty much what's on the agenda for today. And if anything interesting happens in the chat, we'll be um, you know, talking about that as well. But before we uh, get too carried away in anything else, I want to just point out, um, you know, this is the sort of grab bag portion of the show. I came across this interesting thing when I was uh, cleaning up my browser tabs. I was just telling the chat, I have like a million tabs open in my browser for stories people have sent me, links I've clicked on, but then didn't have time to follow up on. Anyway, I'm trying to make a point of not clicking on too many more, but just going through what I had. Anyway, I had this uh, playlist of LaRouche videos. You can see one of them linked down at the bottom. And I just thought it was interesting that this video was titled The Coming Eurasian World of Lyndon LaRouche. People who follow this kind of stuff closely know that Eurasia, Eurasianism, is a buzzword within Russian neo-fascism, specifically the kind of neo-fascism attached to Alexander Dugin. And there is a lot of overlap between Lyndon LaRoucheism and Duganism, exemplified in people like Caleb Maupin, for example. Other people in the group, very much now heavily discredited group, thankfully, known as the Pat Sox or Patriotic Socialists, so named for one of the stands that they took about being patriotic in the United States. Um, so, uh, yeah, anyway... <laughs> the coming Eurasian world of Lyndon LaRouche. They're just sort of embracing this melding openly now. So I commented, LaRouche bags and Duganists, two neo-fascist flavors that taste weird together. Also in that playlist, there's some other great crazy, typically LaRouche, um, you know, I mean, there are conspiracies that go on in the maintenance of empire throughout the world. Capitalism, now imperialism, which is advanced capitalism, is... Um, a system of minoritarian rule based on exploitation and oppression. So naturally the people um, who run it, you know, for the 1% or the 1% of the 1%, etc., they're going to be, you know, the way that they rule could be uh, in some ways described as a conspiracy in that it is, you know, a relatively small group of people who share class interests uh, plotting to do all kinds of nefarious shit against other people, start wars, assassinations, and so on and so on. Now, of course, this is driven by class interests and class struggle, and that's the motive force of history. Um, you know, conspiracy per se is not the motive force of history. Like, these uh, six people met together and, you know, completely changed uh, the course of everything. No, I mean, the particular strategies that the ruling class takes you know, that's shaped by um, historical forces that take hundreds of years to take shape. Of course, you know, the exact form that it takes depends on very specific factors and even to a certain extent, uh, some amount of personal decision. But um, where was I even going here? Oh yeah, so typically sort of uh, tinfoil hat, LaRouche conspiracy stuff. Um, the next video in the playlist is who meddled in our elections? The Brits, because they try to blame everything on um, the British. It's just one of those typically LaRouche things. Anyway, found this interesting as I was sort of cleaning up my browser and closing tabs and things like that. Uh, what else did I have? I know I had something else in the grab bag of stuff. Oh yeah, I wanted to follow up on last week's election stuff with a quick story. Somebody had mentioned in the chat um, that Illinois had passed, you know, we were focusing particularly on the ballot measures. I don't think every state does this, but a fair amount of states have things where in the elections, you're not just voting for a representative. Most of the time that comes out to just be a Democrat or Republican. In some places you get a libertarian, which are arguably even worse than the already hideous Democrats and Republicans. Um, 
once in a great while you get a green or something but anyway in some places you can directly vote on topics whether it's minimum wage or legalizing cannabis or all kinds of other stuff like that and it doesn't always get implemented right away or in its entirety I mean a lot of times it does so it always helps to vote on that stuff at a minimum you get to log what is public opinion on this issue and um, you know that can be very helpful sometimes the legislature ruled as it is by the servants of the one percent who you know, they own both parties uh, they sometimes drag their feet on that but a lot of times this stuff actually gets implemented you know for example a lot of states have in fact decriminalized cannabis and people are no longer getting locked up for it so that's wonderful uh, but you know sometimes they drag their feet they implement it years later or they implement half of it but it's still helpful anyway this is a story from ABC 7 out of Illinois voters passed the workers rights amendment in the 2022 election so what does that mean for Illinois? And then they note that the measure did not get the 60% uh, of those voting on the question, but they did get a majority, more than 50% of all votes cast. So somebody had said Illinois enshrined um, <coughs> the right to organize in their constitution, and here it is. So Chicago, Illinois is a strong union state, and to keep it that way, the labor movement successfully convinced voters to add a new amendment to the state constitution that guarantees government employees the right to organize and collectively bargain over terms of employment. So just to um, kind of have a time out here for some background information, um, I don't know all the specifics on this, but so the NLRB, National Labor Relations Board, that is the federal agency. It was created by the NLRA or the National Labor Relations Act back in the 30s, I think 1935. Um, that governs many employees, but not all. So state employees um, are among those who I believe do not fall under the jurisdiction. Also employees at some very small businesses that do not do uh, a lot of interstate commerce and things like that. So anyway, this was, I guess, a way to um, enshrine organizing rights to people not covered by the NLRA, NLRB, and I guess not already covered by state law either. So anyway, um, where do we, okay. The measure in last week's election was closely watched in Illinois and beyond as a gauge of public support for the labor movement, which has lost grounds, which has lost ground for years in conservative led states. So again, background, the labor movement has been in decline since about 1960, 65. At that point, about a third of U.S. workers in the private sector were unionized. Now, the overall union density in the United States, and this includes the public sector, where it is much higher in the 30 percent range. Um, I mean, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent. The private sector is like 7 or 8 percent. The overall union density as of last year was like 10.3 so very poor labor um, movement in general, just not many uh, workers are unionized. A lot of the reason here is it's incredibly difficult to start a union in the United States. Uh, we've discussed this before. Anyway, union groups say that it could signal a new chapter in the struggle over workers' rights as U.S. union ranks have grown, as everyone from coffee shop baristas to warehouse workers seek to organize. Quote, all the workers' rights amendment does is protect the rights we already have, said Bob Ryder of the Chicago Federation of Labor. So did I misread this? Um, it said government employees. So anyway, um, I don't know if this is just written strangely or whatever. Continuing, supporters view it as a way to ensure workers will always be able to use their collective clout to secure better pay, hours, and working conditions. So time out there again. Those are some of the things that unionized workers often go for. However, what a union is about primarily is shifting the balance of power in the workplace. Unionization is about building worker power. And then that power is used for different things, such as going after better pay, hours, working conditions, you know, scheduling, all that kind of stuff. But it is fundamentally about power. 
because if we get enough of it, eventually we can depose the capitalists entirely and use it to control production as well. Anyway, they also say that it will prevent the legislature, should it undergo a shift to the right, from passing a so-called right-to-work law that would allow workers covered by union contracts not to pay dues. So in the United States, we have these, quote, right-to-work laws, which are basically just sort of union-busting laws. It allows people to benefit from the existence of unions in their workplace without paying into them. Only a few years ago, former Governor Bruce Rauner tried to enact anti-labor legislation for local municipalities. Quote, having something like the Workers' Rights Amendment shuts the door on anti-worker politicians undermining our rights, Ryder said. Ryder said that the amendment will only protect current rights, but not expand them. So I guess I'm a little confused about that intro still. Business groups and conservatives opposed the measure, saying that they think it'll drive up taxes. Of course, they always fucking say it. it's always the taxes. Give unions too much power. Motherfucker, unions have like no power right now, like none almost. Lead to more strikes. You know, strikes, it's one tool in the toolbox of unions, but it is the basically last resort of a union and prompt companies to leave for more industry-friendly states. Well, not if there aren't other more industry-friendly states. And by the way, you know, if you're this afraid of your employees, why do you have a business in the first place? Conservative think tank, the Illinois Policy Institute, opposed it. Quote, essentially what it does is it gives the most extreme powers in the nation to government unions in Illinois, said Austin Berg, Illinois Policy Institute. Do you care to elaborate on the most extreme powers? Berg said that the amendment will allow, for example, the Chicago Teachers Union to bargain for social issues like affordable housing. No! Wait, you're saying that teachers are going to be able to live somewhere? I'm sorry. That's just... He fears the amendment will lead to more strikes and tax hikes. Well, there won't be more strikes if employers will negotiate reasonably. So, yeah. Quote, when there is new power to bargain for one of those things, somebody has to pay for that, and taxpayers of Illinois are going to pay for that. So taxpayers here, it's always this sort of reactionary buzzword for capitalists, people who have money, and so on. And they try to fearmonger to the general public. No. So who has to pay for that? The people who are currently making a killing off of the current economy. That's definitely not me and you. But, you know, of course, if reactionaries had their way, they would indeed have somebody else pay for that, too, even though they're the ones profiting. This is one of the things, even with the income tax, when the income tax was first introduced like 100 years ago in the United States, it was really only applied to the uh, absolute highest incomes. And then over time, um, reactionaries basically shifted that tax burden onto everybody else. So... You know, this is one of the ways that they get uh, more working and middle class buy in on this reactionary bullshit is by, you know, shifting the burden onto us instead. And people may not might not know the whole story about all of that. And then, you know, oh, I hate taxes, too, et cetera. Union rights have taken a beating in Republican led states in recent years. Twenty seven states now have these right to work laws. And Wisconsin went so far as to strip nearly all of its public workers, including teachers, of collective bargaining rights. So, um, you know, this is good. Some fight back on the general, you know, bad state of uh, union rights, the labor movement in the United States. We have a long, long way to go. We really do. All right, see if anything's going on in the chat yet. Eurasianism equals neo-colonialism. First empire to try Eurasianism was the Roman Empire. All the British Crown LaRouche things are just ridiculous. They really are laughable, yeah. Uh, so is it Russian fascism? Yeah, this is one face of it. So there, uh, you know, as many different faces of communism as there are, and many communists will say, you know, some of them are not true, and therefore should not be considered communist. But think of all the different kinds of communism that there are. Um, there are many, many different substrains of um, fascism as well. 
so you know it's a movement that has been around for a while its purpose is basically defending capitalism um, firmly anchoring it into reaction and neo-feudalism and of course being you know anti-socialist anti-communist anti well basically pro-oppression pro-bigotry pro-exploitation so anybody that is fighting against bigotry exploitation oppression um, they're going to be you know fighting against that they want um, the it's it's very elitist uh, fascism is mentality ideology so they are for preserving the rule of a tiny few over most of the population so people like Jordan Peterson who try to uh, tie in you know quote evolutionary biology or uh, evolutionary psychology into this stuff like there's always going to be hierarchy lobsters pee on each other's faces therefore uh, you know capitalism is unavoidable like all, all this kind of stupid stuff that they promote these are all faces of um, you know the conservatism and reaction going into attack mode as they feel very threatened as capitalism goes into greater and greater crisis um, this, this is basically fascism you got psychedelic therapy in Colorado now Congratulations, there's a lot of potential for that. Yeah, somebody's asking about, um, is this a uh, channel for socialism or communism? So socialism is the transition between capitalism and the theorized, hypothetical at this point, has not been realized, um, end state of uh, resolution of class society so um, communists are people who desire to attain communism the vehicle that we use for that is socialism so it's the transition um, you know like the USSR that was a federation of socialist republics or union of socialist republics led by a communist party so that socialism had a destination. The destination is called communism. Nobody has gotten there yet because capitalism, imperialism is still the dominant mode around the world. So it's going to take defeating a lot more uh, capitalism around the world before we're able to move through socialism into communism. You know, and it's not just a question, by the way, uh, for all the people who, you know, will go on endlessly about building up um, the forces of production. Marx was writing in the 1840s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and basically believed at that time that conditions were already set in, you know, large parts of Europe at least for a transition to socialism. This whole idea that, um, you know, we have to have like just products dropping out of chutes all over the place, you know, run by the most advanced computers you know, basically like 31st century technology. That's just simply not the case, and it's, it's an excuse for opportunism. What brings socialism is proletarian revolution, not a particular, um, you know, stage of development of the forces of production. Obviously, there's a certain amount of that. Um, countries do have to at least establish capitalism to a point where there is a substantial proletariat. Um, because the proletariat, the propertyless class of wage workers that's created by capitalism, well, it exists in other, um, under other modes of production, but in capitalism, it really becomes large and dominant. It's the most numerically um, large class under capitalism, and it isn't under earlier modes of production. But it's the proletariat that has to lead that struggle and, and become the ruling class in, uh, in socialism. So, yeah, it's proletarian revolution and not... Um, you know, necessarily a particular uh, level of development of the forces of production that are responsible for socialism. Again, Marx writing in the 19th century felt that the transition could be attempted then, and uh, we're now in 2022. So anyway. Oh yeah, uh, that is true. A uh, hundred Starbucks outlets locations are striking today. So that's absolutely right. I read that last night. It went in my mind and right out. It's like in one ear and out the other. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, many Starbucks locations are striking today and um, power to them. 
The issue with strikes is not a problem of the workers. It's because the capitalists having horrible working conditions. Yeah, going on strike is a huge risk for workers because capitalists are sitting on piles of money that they can use to ride out any interruptions in production. Wage workers are not. I mean, you can have strike funds and mutual aid and support for striking workers, but by and large, I mean, it can be hard to ride out a strike. And you can get locked out, you can get replaced in the United States, according to U.S. labor law. You can be replaced if you go on strike by effectively permanent, quote, temporary replacement workers. So the law calls them temporary replacement workers. In effect, though, there is no time limit for how long those, quote, temporary workers can replace you. So labor law in the United States needs to be gutted and overhauled. Even Bernie Sanders was talking about repealing parts of Taft-Hartley, which was the post-World War II um, draconian anti-labor law. Truman, Democratic President Harry Truman, um, referred to it as a slave labor law. He actually vetoed it, and then Congress overrode the veto. Um, so that's how sort of dead set uh, the ruling class was on imposing this. And this was around the same time, you know, again, after World War II, the left had sort of uh, joined in the popular front um, against fascism and then was promptly discarded right after the war. We, as thanks for, um, you know, helping in the anti-fascist struggle, um, got kicked to the curb. We got Taft-Hartley just decimating our ability to actually do anything. Um, industrial unionism was effectively outlawed. Every kind of labor action that was actually effective outlawed. This right to work stuff um, kind of started then. And um, also we got the Red Scare, McCarthyism, throughout civil society as a whole. You know, the whole, I am not and have never been a member of the Communist Party, like all that. So that stripped out radicals from every facet uh, every single, you know, community, like librarians, um, you name it, the heads of any clubs, like labor unions especially, every area of civil society, um, anybody even slightly suspected of having any communist socialist leanings was basically purged. And so that was our thanks for participating in the Popular Front. Yeah, the taxpayer thing, it is a boogeyman. Um, they don't even fund federal expenditure like what's being given to Ukraine. Yeah. Thoughts on Communist Party of Swaziland? I don't know. I do not know. What do people think of the term PMC, professional managerial class? Well, I can tell you I'm not impressed by most of the people using it who are largely in the um, populist, opportunist, uh, borderline neo-fascist group. Uh, it seems, continuing the comment, it seems to me to be used to attack other workers instead of going after big capitalists. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most charitable take on that is that it's an attempt to update the term petty bourgeoisie, which maybe not everybody knows. And yeah, the petty bourgeoisie is, I mean, literally small capitalists. Bourgeois means property. And in capitalist society, we're talking about bourgeois property. This is capital. It's property that generates profit. So I mean, more or less, there's more to capital than that. Marx happened to write a book. About, it takes about 11 hours to read it out loud. Um, so there's a lot to be said about capital. Um, it's dead labor, m many other things. But yeah, basically... Um, a small capital, as somebody who owns a small amount of capital, or um, so the professional managerial class. You could consider petty bourgeois people who aren't strictly um, wage workers, like lawyers and doctors and people like that, who make, you know, for example, in the United States, doctors make between about $200,000 and $500,000 a year. The higher end is if you're a specialist. Um, this would be more petty bourgeois, it's not sort of just subsistence. Um, and then as far as the managerial thing, most managers are are proletarian in terms of their class standing. 
but Marxists would say that because they have the ability to hire and fire and manage production, they have um, petty bourgeois consciousness, even though they actually are proletarian, like they can be fired by the capitalist and they don't own the means of production, but they do manage it. So the most charitable um, take on PMC, professional managerial class, is it's an attempt to update the term petty bourgeois. But usually how it's actually used is to just write off, uh, you know, Starbucks workers or like whatever, um, whatever kind of workers the right deviationist opportunists are trying to divide off of the working class. Like, for example, the, we're talking about Pat Sox, LaRoucheists, and Duganist neo-fascists before. They were using PMC against Netflix workers who were trying to organize. Uh, no, those are workers. <laughs> those are proletarians. And um, they were trying to use it against Starbucks workers. No, those are proletarian as well. And uh, so, yeah, usually in practice it's used to try to be divisive against workers who are actually organizing. So I, I, I'm not really, uh, not really there. Uh, right to work, so somebody said, I thought right to work just meant that you aren't obligated to join a union. It does partly mean that, but the thing is, if you're in a union workplace, you are benefiting from the union negotiations. And so, Basically, what it is, is um, it's an attempt by capitalists to try to undermine financial support for unions. So there used to be something called a closed shop where you could not join if you did not join the union. There's like several different, basically, gradations of union control over a workplace. So the closed shop, um, the IWW, Industrial Workers of the World, or the Wobblies, one of the more radical um, labor unions, Eugene Debs helped to co-found it. Um, they used to have a slogan, an open union and a closed shop. So that was their sort of plan for takeover. And I gets my seal of approval personally. Um, so the open union part meant that anyone could join the union. So you didn't have to be a white male breadwinner as you know, many of the uh, unions would discriminate against women or people who weren't white, etc. So an open union, any worker can join, and a closed shop, meaning you can't get a job if you don't join the union. So that's how unions actually would gain strength, and that makes sense, and that's entirely, again, that's, that's sensible. That's how you um, keep your union from being undermined. But this was, <clears throat> excuse me, this was taken down um, after... Taft-Hartley, and various different levels were brought in, including the right to work stuff. So it's a way to uh, basically starve the union of dues money, because people would be like, oh, well, I can still get the benefits without paying into it. And so you get all this free riding, and eventually the union um, is struggling to actually do anything, and then it, it dies. So anyway, that's that's part of it. If or when Twitter goes bankrupt, do you think we will see less of a monopoly of one social media company being used to organize online? With the rise of algorithms suppressing our methods, I feel we need to go back to older methods of organizing like email lists. Yeah, I mean, email lists are kind of annoying, but um, they work. And, you know, social media, I think it's good for like, basically, you know, magazine subscriptions and stuff like that. It's sort of taken the place of some of that to, um, you know, also get exposed to things that you wouldn't get exposed to normally. It's like an email list. If you're not subscribed to the list, you're just not going to see any of the content. And um, on social media, if you follow somebody and they retweet something or they share something, you're going to get exposed to stuff that, you know, that other person you were following is helping to spread and curate. So I think that there is a lot of value to that. Um, you know, it's good for spreading memes and this and that. And I think as far as email lists, maybe the Discord server is taking over more of that role. I do not think that email lists are sort of the height of organizing. They can get really clunky and um, just fill up your inbox to where people like dread even opening it. And, uh, you know, I remember those days well. Um, I've been somebody who's contributed significantly to email lists. I don't miss it. 
and uh, looking back, I don't think those were great times. So, um, do I think that there will be less of a monopoly? No, because I think that the nature of it is you want to be where people are. And so the platforms with the most, okay, so for example, just the other day, somebody was posting a thing like, well, basically with this exact question of if Twitter goes belly up, where are people going? And somebody posted a site called Hexbear, which I had not heard of before. And I checked it out. It has 21,000 users. Okay. I mean, um, that's not that appealing, really. Like, there's plenty of Twitter accounts I follow that, I mean, just the YouTube account for S4A alone has more than half of the, like, total users that um, Hexbear has. So who wants to put time and effort into posting when nobody's going to see it? So uh, I don't know. I do think it's still going to be probably larger platforms. You know, whether there's two or three of them or six to ten of them, I don't know. But um, I think that people are always going to have their preferences and individuals are always going to favor one or two over the others. And, uh, you know, there's just a limit to like how much time in the day people can actually spend on these sites. Um, you know, especially now that Musk has taken over Twitter, I'm using this as an excuse to sort of step back from Twitter. I've mentioned before that I was closing a lot of tabs that I had opened in the last two months and just never got around to. I'm specifically trying to uh, step back from that and not, you know, I, I, I didn't do Twitter for the first year and a half of S4A, um, in a, you know, as S4A. And um, it really can suck you in to a level, especially for somebody like me trying to do a channel that is fairly impersonal and trying to just reach thousands and thousands ideally tens of millions of people were not there yet um, but uh, you know when you're just trying to reach lots of the masses if you will with um, with a uh, with the message forget where I was even going with this um, completely lost my train of thought anyway I'm trying to get off Twitter that's that's the bottom line here I, I guess my point is um, getting into it I got really really tangled up there's some people who follow me and who um, comment on a lot of S4A stuff, and I think that they're perfectly great. There's other people who uh, get a bit personal with it, I think, to the point where I had somebody the other day get really mad because I deleted... I didn't even delete their comment on YouTube. I deleted somebody else's comment that they had replied to, and... Um, they like uh, sent me this like email getting all mad about it. I'm like, look, we're not like close personal friends here. Um, you know, please go run several social media accounts with thousands of followers and get back to me. Um, it's very draining, especially when many of the people following you are in fact attacking you or just sort of nitpicking things. It gets really, really old. And um, yeah, I don't publish every comment. So... <laughs> You know, um, it'll be nice to, I think, step back from some of that for me because it can get over-involving, like, kind of quickly. And again, I didn't do it at all for the first, like, year and a half of S4A and um, might be taking a step back off of Twitter soon. Not entirely, but a big step back. Anyway, that was partly your question and partly just other stuff I felt like uh, talking about. Yeah, social media is decent for spreading propaganda, dog shit for organizing. I've encountered a lot of stuff I never would have seen otherwise. I think also it's not good for organizing, but it is good for publicizing the results of actions. Like people can stage a protest or a strike or a march or whatever and put a two minute video of it up on Twitter and then people share it. And I've seen so many things and I've shared them on the channel here and in the streams uh, many times I just wouldn't have wouldn't have seen anywhere else so if you know if Twitter didn't exist I w just wouldn't have seen it and if you saw it through S4A you wouldn't have seen it either um, without Twitter so yeah it's good for like publicizing the end results of organizing not for organizing itself 
So another one, I have a Discord server, I have members from all over, and we have lots of conversations to educate people who are newer. And that's really good. And I think sometimes people look to S4A for that kind of thing. And I do, or I have at least up to this point, we're coming up on three years in February. So it's it's been uh, two and two third years. And I have up till now been able to like message back and forth with a lot of people. And I, I'm seeing that time coming to an end because there's 11,000 subscribers on the channel now and there's like 7,600 people following on Twitter. I just can't um, respond to as many people for a number of reasons. I just can't. So I do think that there's going to be a place and we want this movement to grow. And, you know, I'd like S4A to be an entry point. That's kind of always what I intended it to be as an entry point for people. But once they get beyond that entry point, yeah, it's going to be more down to those, um, you know, relationships on a Discord server, on smaller groups where the people running those Discord servers aren't trying to juggle communications with like 20,000 people or something. So, yeah, I mean, we all have our role to play in this movement. S4A is what it is, and it's not what it's not. So I'm just... You know, as the channel grows, it was one thing when it was 4,000 subscribers. You know, the amount of direct messages you're getting off of that, that's manageable. As it grows, and especially as it gets up to 15, 20, there's going to be lots of people I just literally cannot reply to. Um, especially not for like 600 a month, which is all I get to do this through the Patreon. So, you know, there's just a real limit to that. Um, even, even the streaming for me, I'm like, this is taking up a lot of time. So... Uh, you know, as we enter year three, I do want to keep up regular content. In other words, I do not want S4A or just, and there's nothing wrong with this, but it's like my plan for the channel is not for it to be one of those channels that puts out like two, maybe three videos a month. Some channels do that. And, you know, they do like more of the video essays. I'm thinking of like Hakeem, Marxist Paul, channels that do sort of like a video every two or three weeks. Um... That's not what S4A started as. It's not what I intended to be. To be totally honest, I need to vent a lot more than that. I also like doing more off the cuff content. Um, I don't like writing out essays. Uh, after all of my education, I'm like kind of done on essays. I do like talking though. So it's easy for me to get a few ideas going, get a few stories going and then talk. That's easy for me. Um, but, you know, how many days and hours I can do it a week is something that remains to be seen. Um, yeah, okay, enough about that. I'm on Discord a lot more than Facebook these days. Somebody says I needed a break from that unmitigated garbage fire. Yeah, Facebook is crap. We did a video um, about it. Uh, S4A got kicked off of Facebook three times and then I was just like, okay, I'm done. Like I could go buy a burner phone, I could make another account, but I don't want to have, you know, wasted the money if it just gets kicked off again. Plus, it's full of absolute boomers now. I feel like the discussions and the content is better on Twitter than on Facebook by far. Like if you look at what's trending on Facebook, it's fucking Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro, um, you know, like random other conservative guy. But Ben Shapiro will be in, like, slots 1, 3, 5, 6, and 9. And then it'll be, you know, some other random conservatives in the other slots. It is boomer-dominated, conservative-dominated, and the board that runs Facebook is, like, right-wing, you know, far-right Republican activists. So uh, we did a story on this Facebook equals Fashbook uh, that was, you know, covering some journalism on that. So I used to like Facebook in terms of you didn't have the character limit and you could do some good stuff with it. And, um, you know, the groups were pretty good on Facebook and you could share content into groups. And um, anyway, I figured out how to use Facebook pretty well. But S4A is you know permanently done with Facebook and it does drive a lot of content. There's another difference, which is that. Um, so Elon Musk got schooled on this recently, too. He obviously buys Twitter, spends $44 billion to become the permanent main character of Twitter, and then um, doesn't know a fucking thing about it. So there was somebody, uh, Musk got into a disagreement with somebody like, no, Twitter actually drives a huge number of clicks, 
it's the biggest um, driver of clicks on the internet by far. And then collectively, everyone responding to the thread, uh, you can do a thing on Twitter like add context. So there was like a little bubble appearing underneath uh, Musk's tweet that was like, actually no, Twitter drives 7% of online traffic. And um, I think it was Reddit also drives, no, Pinterest also drives 7% of clicks to other websites. So Twitter is literally on the same level as Pinterest as far as driving clicks to other websites. Facebook drives 74%. So there's a big difference there also for the users. If you're on Twitter, this is why it hasn't been as good for S4A. If you're on Twitter, the message I get from that is you're looking for content on Twitter. If you want somebody to see something and you're on Twitter, you have to put it directly into Twitter. You can't put it as a link because most people aren't gonna click it. That's um, different on Facebook. People are clicking links off of Facebook all day long and actually reading the stuff. But I think that that's also because Facebook you can like copy paste in whole articles because there's no character limit. So that's the thing about Twitter is like, if you want somebody to watch a video, like that's what S4A, primarily a YouTube channel, is all about. Um, if you put a YouTube link, it's not gonna drive much traffic. But if you embed the video directly into Twitter, which unfortunately there's like a three minute limit unless you're some kind of super user account, um, people aren't gonna watch it. So that's another difference. The different social media things are different. But it was hilarious watching Musk. He just spent $44 billion <clears throat> on a website. Doesn't know the first thing about it. Somebody, I think the same poster joked, like, buying KFC, then frantically Googling what is chicken. You know, like, did you know anything about this website you just purchased? Um, somebody else, uh, I got banned on Twitter in December 17 for calling George H.W. Bush a war criminal when he died. Twitter sucks because you have to be logged on to view it. You do for Facebook now, too. You didn't used to have to be logged in on Facebook, but you do now. And Twitter, um, you don't have to be logged in to view it. You um, can view at least the first few posts without being logged in. If you scroll down a certain extent, it puts that login screen. But you can read just like a post or two um, without logging in. And that's not just like a post or two like, you know, some newspaper sites. They'll have a paywall after your fourth article. It's like on one link. If you scroll down too far, it'll make you log in. But you can keep reading different Twitter links. So, yeah. Random reminder, uh, remember not to bring your phone to org and party meetings. Good reminder. I mean, people's orgs and parties are going to have different policies on that. But um, don't forget, your phone is a surveillance device. Time for us to address anti-Asian hate crimes on the rise in the USA, with Trump saying racist anti-Asian comments about Glenn Youngkin. I missed that. Of course, Trump is running for president again. He announced it. He's going to be back in 2024, and he filed the paperwork today. So, um, or I saw that he had filed the paperwork today. So he filed it very recently. So yeah, good. I'm glad that the reading list playlists help a lot. And if anybody has other um, socialist reading list or like syllabus playlists, I would like to do more of those. I think that they're, you know, I have yet to do the S4A recommended reading list. I'm just doing other people's recommendations. We'll do mine eventually, but um, I think that there's enough recommendations up there now. Facebook is just a hive for far-right conspiracy theories. Uh, yeah, it's gotten like really bad, so I'm not even on it. I haven't been on it for like a year, over a year now, so I can't even comment that much. Um, somebody else, I used it a lot when I was in active bands, but it was total garbage for that. I really have no more use for it these days. I cannot thank you enough for your channel. The Spectre haunted me recently and I love to read, but my ADHD, recovering alcoholic brain makes it difficult. I listen to you reading pretty much every day. Well, thank you. That's encouraging. And um, yeah, I, uh, I haven't been doing as many of the audiobooks. That is for some structural reasons. Um, part of it is I've been spending so much time on these streams and I do enjoy the streams. Um, and, but yeah, the other thing is like there's so many, there's hundreds of um, audiobooks up on the channel right now, like 270, something like that. It's over 200. It's well over 200. 
So um, I feel like there's so much stuff up there already. When I start seeing the movement showing some evidence that they've actually like read this stuff, maybe I'll add more. And, um, you know, yeah. I got banned for the third time many years ago and washed my hands of Facebook. It wasn't great then and has only gotten worse. I think that the best thing about Facebook was the groups. Um, you could make groups and some of those were really fun, like meme sharing groups. There was a great one um, on, uh, there was a great one, Jordan Peterson's like Neverland Ranch for Lost Boys, something like that. There were some really funny ones. People would come up with, um, very amusing names for the groups where memes were shared and stuff like that. So, uh, again, that, that's how S4 actually started out. All right, let us now, we've caught up with the chat and two trolls have been banned. So anyway, let us um, get into, let's just go through the COVID stuff quick, then we'll pick up the rent and the uh, organizing the unemployed articles. I don't think this COVID stuff is gonna take super long. Famous last words I know, but um, none of the things are that long. So let's start off with our old friend Biobot. B-I-O-B-O-T dot I-O slash data. That's where you can find this. And this is COVID wastewater monitoring. So the sort of um, green, light green curve, that's cases. And the blue curve, that is um, basically viral particles, viral um, genetic material detected in wastewater. As I've said many times, I think this is the best, most reliable method for monitoring COVID because you can see um, over time, the wastewater is following the cases pretty closely until when? After Omicron and really kind of during Omicron. Why? Because the tests, that green curve, is reported tests, mainly PCR tests. Well, what's the problem with that? We're no longer doing PCR tests. People are doing rapid tests in their home, and if they test positive, they're not necessarily reporting that anywhere. So effectively, cases are not really being counted. It used to be in 2020 and 2021 that there was regular weekly testing in colleges and workplaces and other institutions. So we, we had a really reliable high level of testing for a long period of time. And when they were positive, they would get logged on charts like these. Well, now we don't have that anymore. The other thing about um, the cases is it takes, there's a lag. So different indicators of a situation uh, will either be leading or lagging. Wastewater monitoring is a leading indicator because it shows up whether or not the person is trying to um, log it. You can be completely asymptomatic and unaware that you have any COVID in your body, but if you're using a toilet um, and flushing and it gets into the wastewater system, the people who you know read your poop are going to be um, picking it up. So anyway, wastewater monitoring, it's fast. It doesn't rely on people developing symptoms and then going and getting tested. And then there's like a week you know, lag from that. Um, hospitalizations is of course, there's another lag after that because it takes a while for you to get sick enough to get hospitalized. And then of course deaths lag beyond that because it takes even longer to get sick enough to get the test, to get hospitalized and then to die. So anyway, leading versus lagging indicators. So I like the wastewater monitoring. And we're gonna look at a couple of articles um, critiquing the whole COVID is over thing. Now, you look at this chart of wastewater. Tell me, does COVID look fucking over to you? It might look not as bad if you look at the case counts, but then remember, we're not testing. And when we do test, it's mostly rapid tests, and those don't get counted by and large. So, we look at wastewater. And no, we're having a gigantic sustained outbreak. This is a rolling outbreak. First it was BA2, then BA4 and 5. Now it's all the BA4 and 5 offspring, like BA4.6, B, the BQ family, XBB. Right now there's about half a dozen strains. And if we um, do a close-up, this is the last six months broken down by region. 
we can see that that orangey yellow that's the northeast you can see it looks like it's down squinting but it looks like down to Maryland um, up through New England there was a big outbreak um, a couple of weeks ago and then it came sharply down and it's at a more moderate level but still high it's around 750 um, and uh, so again let's go back to the um, the other chart just to get a sense of what does 750 mean look on the left side of the graph because the the right side those numbers zero five hundred thousand a million those are the daily cases it's on the left side a thousand two thousand three thousand four thousand what is that it says right there wastewater effective SARS coronavirus two, coronavirus 2 concentration copies of virus per milliliter of sewage so what does 750 mean well let's go up about three quarters of the way um, to that first peak that was the spring 2020 peak and then let's go to winter 2020 2021 where it says January 21 and then let's go to the Delta peak which is the next peak it's before the massive Omicron peak so all those peak like kind of between 800 900 so 750 is not far behind that 750 is still, is still pretty significant okay so back to the regions now that we have um, you know some some measure for reference well the Northeast was as of like just a couple of weeks ago up above a thousand like in the 1250 range that is above either the um, you know spring 2020 or that winter or Delta and kind of by a lot so that has dropped but both the Midwest um, so that would be like the Dakotas over to Ohio um, down to like Nebraska and that area there Kansas so that's starting to rise and also the West the green that is starting to rise as well so far the Southeast Texas Florida West Virginia that sort of triangle that is flat um, but you know it, it's these things they just go up and down and as we were discussing yesterday in an article there are whole families of virus now it's not just one strain there's whole families of virus that are competing with each other and they're surging they're abating they're surging they're abating sometimes you'll have three things surging in one area and two things on the decline it's just sort of a complete free-for-all and we've never been in the situation until this year why are we in it now no masking vaccines are wearing off people aren't getting the booster shot and mainly the no masking and no other uh, transmission control so we're in the situation now where there's like dozens of different strains that are very active and showing a big presence and um, we're just allowing that as a society meanwhile China which has taken a much stricter approach to controlling this um, they are still dealing with the original strain and like Delta so they don't have this whole crazy situation like that all right so that's where we're at um, overall now am I missing this thing yes I am so let me just take a second there's a graph out of England I want to show you uh, probably because it was in a different folder that's why there it is all right apologies for all the clicking and the delay but here we go all right should be there now boom so this is COVID-19 England and they're showing um, 26th of March 2020 to today 17th of November 2022 so we have a number of different measures here and this is again going back to like the start of the pandemic spring 2020 to now does it look over to you because it doesn't look over at all to me most of these measures are in the same ballpark some are even higher than they were back then and these are things like patients in ventilation beds covid nhs that's the national health service um, admissions daily covid hospital inpatients um, so this is what we're looking at here. There's a lot of different COVID deaths in the last seven days. Does it look fucking over? Doesn't look over to me, not at all. And obviously that's just England, but um, yeah. So let's do, this is an article out of Australia um, that is you know, basically a head-on attack on the idea that COVID is over. 
So this is from The Age. The notion that COVID-19 has been vanquished is not supported by the facts. This is from two weeks ago, November 2nd, by David Berger, emergency doctor. We are storytellers. It's what distinguishes us from all other species. Well, as far as we know. It's how we make sense of the world, how we transmit knowledge down the generations, and how we soothe ourselves. Right now, we're telling ourselves a soothing story about COVID-19, one that follows the pattern of many of the fairy tales we've liked to tell since our days around the campfire. It has a typical beginning, a dark threat stalks us, a middle, a valiant and desperate fight against overwhelming odds, an end, the foe vanquished, a return to normal. The pleasing notion that COVID has now been vanquished, however, that it has been turned into, quote, just another seasonal upper respiratory virus by vaccination, quote, hybrid immunity from repeated infection, and natural attenuation of the virus itself is not supported by facts. New variants continue to arrive irrespective of season, and the world is now on its eighth actuarial analysis from around the world, including in Australia, shows an ongoing 10 to 15 percent excess death rate as compared with before the pandemic. These deaths are mostly in the older age group, of which about half are directly due to COVID-19. An analysis from Singapore shows the rest, quote, can be explained by patients who passed away from other illnesses within 90 days after being infected by COVID-19, unquote. So pause. We did a story on this recently. Uh, Julie Powell, a writer, um, died at 49 of a heart attack six weeks after having a really bad case of COVID. And we've covered stories in the past about out of India, I think it was Mumbai, um, heart attacks, the rate of heart attacks went up sixfold in 2021. So COVID, even if you survive that first, you know, two, three, four weeks of acute infection, there is a greatly raised risk of death within the next 12 months. We've seen this also population studies out of Estonia, study I believe over a million people in a healthcare database, and people who had COVID were more likely to die in the next 12 months than people who didn't have COVID. And what do we know about reinfection after you get your second COVID infection, your third, your fourth? That risk keeps going up. All right, the next story we're going to do about this is actually about this in Japan. Data from other countries supports excess mortality in the year after COVID infection. That's what we were just talking about. And we know that COVID causes increased cardiovascular and other mortality. Time out again, because you can call COVID, it's very irresponsible to call COVID an upper respiratory virus, by the way. That is its primary route of entry, and it will affect the lungs and the throat and the sinuses, because that's where it comes in but it also affects your heart, your blood vessels. It causes clotting anomalies, for example, in your blood vessels. Damages the liver, it infects the brain directly, causes brain damage. It lives in the gut, it infects and kills your T cells in your immune system. It affects most of your major organs. So calling it just an upper respiratory virus, completely irresponsible. So again, we know COVID causes increased cardiovascular and other mortality. Excess deaths in younger age groups are lower, but still very significant, given lower mortality rates in that group in the first place. Average lifespans are dropping by between one and more than two years in various countries, according to global mortality data. We've covered that in the U.S., where the U.S. is now back to 1996, I believe, um, life expectancy, because it has dropped so much, and it drops differently in different uh, demographics. So, for example, Alaska Natives and uh, Native Americans, it's fallen closer to seven years because they've been harder hit by the pandemic. Continuing, but deaths are not the only metric. High rates of long COVID, which consists of a smorgasbord of chronic conditions, are already being felt in terms of labor shortages and seem to be accumulating both human and economic effects over time. The ultra long-term effects of COVID on the immune, neurological, that'd be your brain and nerves, and other systems are unknown. But there is mounting evidence that there could be that these could be very considerable. Ever increasing knowledge of the role of viruses in causing diseases such as multiple sclerosis and many cancers should make us especially cautious. 
As Professor Don Bodish, Canada Research Chair in Aging and Immunity, recently said, quote, Canadians collectively are going to be less healthy and live shorter lives than we did in the pre-COVID world. And obviously that doesn't just go for Canada, it goes for everywhere, um, including in countries that, you know, there's still countries today where frontline healthcare workers haven't even gotten vaccinated yet because of intellectual property restrictions by the greedy capitalist uh, medical supply companies. Finally, rampant transmission leads to rampant mutation of the virus. Thank you, somebody, for pointing this out. I point this out constantly. So viruses, um, when they replicate, that's where mutation occurs. You know, there are naturally errors in um, transcription and translation. And so genetic material sometimes gets messed up as the virus is being replicated. That's where you get mutation. So the more it gets transmitted, the more it replicates, the more it's going to mutate. So anyway, finally, rampant transmission leads to rampant mutation of this virus with no guarantee that mutation is towards, quote, mildness. Instead, a roulette wheel of potentially nasty surprises lies in our future. And as any gambler should know, the house tends to win in the end. With no consent, no mandate, no public discussion, the dry tinder, the elderly, those with chronic disease, those most at risk of reaping, as Chief Medical Officer Paul Kelly has termed them, is being burned off. Deaths and infirmity in these individuals can be easily explained away and so easily discounted. The only way to identify that this is happening is through statistical analysis of death and illness rates. These analyses accumulate daily and are remarkably consistent around the globe, but statistical reports are not eye-catching and are easily ignored when it is expedient to do so. In the same way, horror stories from a healthcare system burdened by abnormally high rates of illness can conveniently be explained away by citing decades of underfunding, creating, quote, a dam that has finally burst. Well, yeah, but why are they underfunded? Anyway, claims that levels of increased sickness are due to immune debt, a phrase only invented in 2021, arising from lack of exposure to common viruses during lockdowns are simply not credible. So just to explain that for a minute, immune debt, uh, they're trying to say, people who are minimizing the effects of COVID are trying to say that, oh, because people, you know, weren't out in the world as much in 2020, it like their immune system sort of went to sleep. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's simply not credible, to, to quote this author. Nor are claims that lockdowns themselves have created a backlog of undertreated conditions. These excess deaths and illnesses occur equally in places that never had lockdowns. Let's try actually going to the next screen. The facts of living with COVID are far from the soothing fairy tale of a complete return to pre-pandemic life. Abandoning two centuries of public health principles of disease suppression means accepting older and more vulnerable folk dying earlier, chronic ill health, and eventually a shortened average lifespan for all of us, and a high risk of long-term unknown unknowns from repeated infection with a multi-pathogenic virus. So um, that means uh, it, it's creating disease in many different ways. So it can create kidney damage, heart damage, like I said, brain damage, immune damage. So what does all this cause? We don't know because it's only been going on a couple of years. We don't know what the long-term effects of this are. And just to you know make a comparison, uh, when you first contract HIV, which you know, God forbid, don't get HIV, but uh, when people get infected with HIV, you initially get flu-like symptoms. And then of course, the long-term effects are immune destruction. Also polio, upfront flu-like symptoms as you first get it, but can result in paralysis and so on. So long COVID, you know, we're talking about long HIV, becoming AIDS, long polio, paralysis, uh, long COVID, who knows what. We've already seen horrific things, even just in the couple of years it's been around. We weren't asked if an initial push to vaccinate, followed by total surrender to transmission, was what we wanted, when actually there is so much we can do to keep ourselves healthy, including a rolling program of boosters, vaccination of the younger children, better masking, and improving the quality of our shared indoor air 
through better ventilation and filtration. That was the first, I really had no complaints with that article. And as you know, if you've been listening to me read these for a while, um, I usually have at least some criticisms. That was actually really good. So um, kudos to that guy. Now let's go into another one quickly. I mentioned that Japan was um, showing, uh, you know, some higher rates of, well, here, let's just read. This is from coronaheadsup.com. And you can see there the Our World in Data chart recently, since early September, Japan has had a big spike in deaths. And then we have the headline here, Japan, 89% of those who died of COVID in the latest wave had moderate symptoms. So is this something now with the newer strains that you're not really going to see people dying as much during the acute phase, but more like two months later after they have seemingly recovered? And again, Julie Powell, um, a food writer who uh, wrote the book, I think that there was a movie, Julie and Julia, about Julia Child, um, a famous cook, anyway, our chef, um, what was I saying? Yeah, got really sick and then died of a heart attack at the age of 49, fairly young for, for that, um, six weeks later. So is this just a thing with the newer um, strains, especially it was happening with the older strains as well, but is it going to be a shift from first month deaths to like second, third, fourth month deaths? All right. So Japan says that it, an increasing percentage of people are dying after developing moderate symptoms of COVID-19. Japan's National Center for Global Health and Medicine says an increasing percentage of people are dying after developing moderate symptoms of COVID-19. It also says many of them had pre-existing conditions that worsened after they became infected. So time out there on pre-existing conditions. Um, overweight and obesity are considered pre-existing conditions for COVID, and that qualifies about 80% of the United States for having a pre-existing condition. And then, you know, of course, there's many other things, heart issues, lung issues, diabetes, like all kinds of stuff where you're not necessarily overweight or obese. So how many, you know, what percentage of people have pre-existing conditions in the U.S. for COVID? 85%, I would guess, something like that, maybe up to 90%. The center says that a smaller percentage of COVID-19 patients has been developing serious pneumonia in Japan as the vaccination rate increases, while more have died because the coronavirus causes their pre-existing conditions to worsen. So they're saying flat out, you know, it used to be that people would die from like lung shutdown, their lungs would get fluid, that serious pneumonia, in the first, you know, like the third week of a bad infection. People would get hospitalized, they'd be put on the um, ventilators to be like, you know, get assistance with breathing. And, um, that's not really happening so much, but people are dying a little bit further down the line. And then finishing this off, uh, deaths from COVID in Japan are starting are continuing to breach record highs, even though the seventh wave of cases started to decline on uh, the 24th of August. So in other words, the cases have dropped way down in Japan. And I don't know what the case count situation is and testing is in Japan right now, but even in relation to, you know, the cases, we, we have to assume, in other words, that this spike um, that we saw, what, that we see on the chart, you know, it was consistent um, testing rates from the beginning to the end of that relatively short period of time. Yet the deaths were still going on after the, the cases go down. So it's like people seemingly with their COVID resolving and then suddenly dying out of nowhere. So don't get this thing, mask, um, and specifically N95, KN95, although N95 is more reliable to not be counterfeit. My understanding is um, because the KN95 is not a U.S., it's a Chinese standard, not U.S., there's not like uh, the same penalties in the U.S. for making counterfeit ones here. I mean, there would be in China. But um, N95s, on the other hand, if you make counterfeit in the U.S., that's in violation of more laws is my understanding. So anyway, I read an estimate that um, somewhere around 60% of KN95s in the U.S. are counterfeit. I haven't been able to follow that up, but the easier thing is just wear an N95. That's what I've been doing. Um, you can also get N99s, P100s, um, elastomeric masks that, you know, they look like the gas mask and 
that's going to give you the best protection that there is, the P100. But don't get this thing. Don't get COVID. Because even if you don't die in those first few weeks, what's going to happen in the following year? All right. Um, trying to look at which to do next. I got a couple more, and then we'll get back into the rent article. But let's do the Delta one here. We got one on Delta. And where is my thing? No, you know what? Let's do let's do the kids article instead. Now, what did I save that as? That's that's the real question here. COVID kids. There we go. Oh, and this is just a one screen. Um, too many things. So this is uh, it's I believe still a preprint. Yeah, it is. It's on Med Archive. COVID-19 is a leading ca cause of death of children and young people ages zero to 19 years in the United States. Um, lead person is Seth Flaxman. So this is a preprint, uh, and it has not yet been full the, through the full peer review process, but just read the abstract quickly. COVID-19 has caused more than 1 million deaths in the U.S., including at least 1,204 deaths among children and young people aged uh, zero to 19 years, children and young people abbreviated CYP, with almost 800 occurring in the one year period, April 1st, 2021 to March 31st, 2022. So two thirds of those deaths almost um, happen in between spring of 2021 and this spring, uh, March 31st, 2022. So that's like a full year into the officially acknowledged pandemic in the US. Deaths among U.S. CYP are rare in general, and so we argue here that the mortality burden of COVID-19 in CYP is best understood in the context of all other causes of CYP death. Using publicly available data from CDC Wonder on, yeah, on, sorry, the thing is tiny, on NCHS's 113 selected causes of deaths and comparing to mortality in 2019, the immediate pre-pandemic period we find that COVID-19 mortality is among the 10 leading causes of death in CYP, age 0 to 19 in the U.S., ranking 8th among all causes of deaths, 5th in disease-related causes of deaths, uh, excluding accidents, assault, and suicide, and 1st in deaths caused by infectious or respiratory diseases. COVID-19 deaths constitute 2.3% of the 10 leading causes of death in this age group. COVID-19 caused substantially more deaths in CYP than major vaccine-preventable diseases did historically in the period before vaccines became available. Various factors, including underreporting and COVID-19's role as a contributing cause of death from other diseases, mean that our estimates may underestimate the true mortality burden of COVID-19. So they're saying 1,200 deaths got attributed to COVID, but because it's a contributing, it, it makes you sicker, like across the board. It weakens your immune system. Again, infects any major organ that has ACE2 receptors. So brain, brainstem, heart, blood vessels, kidney, liver, lungs, um, you know, intestines, major systemic problems. In fact, especially in children, it can cause um, massive inflammatory uh, response across the entire body and causes death in that way uh, sometimes directly. But because it's causing all of this disease throughout the body, all this inflammation, it may not get pegged as the cause. Something else may get pegged as the cause, but the COVID directly um, put that person's other, that children or young person's um, illness over the level where it became fatal. So anyway, uh, our findings underscore the public health relevance of COVID-19 to CYP in the likely future context of sustained SARS coronavirus 2 circulation, meaning what is likely is that the U U.S. is not going to lift a fucking finger to stop transmission. Pharmaceutical and non-pharmaceutical interventions will continue to play an important role in limiting transmission of the virus in CYP and mitigating severe disease. So that's basically a fancy way of describing the fact that the U.S. isn't going to do a fucking thing to stop transmission in children and younger people or really in anyone else. So we need to fall back on, is there a pill for it? And if there isn't, tough shit. So this is not what we call practicing good public health at all. Um, we're now going to do two articles to close this out. We'll go back into the chat, then rent and organizing the unemployed. So uh, which one first? 
Well, since we were just talking about children, we will do RSV real quick and then we'll come back to COVID. But um, the thing is that we're seeing a lot of different viruses. Uh, speaking of, you know, COVID being a contributing factor in other things. And again, we know that COVID can cause decreased T cell counts by infecting and killing T cells. Um, we're seeing surges of virus that aren't always found, like some Ebola or monkeypox is a great example, where the previous or biggest monkeypox outbreak was like 250 cases or something like that in the US. And then we got about 30,000 this year. That's unprecedented. Why? Why are these diseases surging now? So this is from BBC Family Tree, uh, the little known virus that surged in children this year. And this is RSV, which we're about to learn all about. This is also driving um, massive pediatric hospitalization and ICU um, over, overload right now. So this is from uh, two months ago, 13 September by, oh no, this is from last year, wow. I didn't even realize how old this was. Well, this is surging again this year. Uh, Sophie Hardock. Doctors used to know RSV as a seasonal virus that emerged in the winter, but in the last few months in the Northern Hemisphere, there's been a surprising surge in cases. So again, this really didn't go away. This is from a, uh, 14 months ago, and it continues to be a problem right now. If it was unusual last year, it's even more unusual for it to have this kind of sustained um, surge. Anyway, in early 2021, staff at Maimonides, I guess, Children's Hospital in Brooklyn, New York, were starting to feel a cautious sense of relief. COVID-19 cases in the city were falling as a side effect of social distancing, mask wearing, and hand washing. They had also seen far fewer other viral infections, such as the flu. But then in March, a growing number of coughing children and babies arrived at the hospital, some of them struggling to breathe. They'd been infected with RSV, short for respiratory syncytial virus, a common winter bug that can cause lung problems. At this time of the year, RSV cases should have been dwindling. Instead, they were soaring. Over the months that followed, out-of-season RSV surges would disrupt summers in places as far afield as the southern U.S., Switzerland, Japan, and the U.K. The virus's strange behavior appears to be an indirect consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, doctors say. Last year, lockdowns and hygiene measures suppressed the spread of coronavirus, but also other viruses such as RSV. So this is the immune debt theory. This is bullshit. As a result, children did not have the opportunity to build up immunity against them. But yeah, this hasn't been in place for a long time now. So this, yeah, this is bullshit theory. Once the measures were loosened, RSV found a large pool of susceptible babies and children to infect, leading to sudden surges at unexpected times. Are they actually critiquing this theory? Because again, we're in 2022, nothing resembling a lockdown has been in place for a very long time. And uh, obviously this theory is bullshit. Um, so anyway, the unseasonal outbreaks stretched wards to their limits put families on alert, and showed just how deeply COVID-19 and the associated measures had reshaped the world. For staff on the ground, the experience was dramatic. Our ICU again became overwhelmed, this time not with COVID, but with another virus, recalls Rabia Aga, the director of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at that hospital I mentioned before. At the peak of the outbreak in early April, the majority of children admitted into the ICU were being admitted for RSV. Around the world, the virus ripped through populations of young children who had been shielded from infectious diseases for months. So again, they keep stating this immune debt uh, theory. This is just not the case, and it probably doesn't even apply to 2021 either. At his hospital, RSV cases usually peak in January and hover around zero in the summer months of June to August. This year, there were no cases in winter. Instead, they began to rise steeply in June, then soared to 183 infections in July, higher than in previous winter seasons. We were full, every single bed was occupied, and that's a challenge, Berger recalls at the height of the outbreak in July. His hospital had to transfer sick babies and children with RSV to other hospitals that still had space. Several other Swiss hospitals experienced the same. I'm going to skip the rest of this article because it's laden with this immune debt theory, which again, you know, I could see um, 
accepting with a certain amount of, you know, uh, grains of salt taken. Now we're in 2022. This has just been basically torn to shreds. But anyway, a little bit about RSV. This has been going on for a long time. We did another article on this uh, uh, a couple of streams ago. So anyway, RSV, it is still around and uh, been around for longer than I realized. So moving on, this is our last COVID article. And this is on Delta. And this one is from recently, just two weeks ago. So what do we have here? This is from Fortune. Um, scientists have their eyes on several Delta crons. New COVID variants with the potential to attack the lungs like Delta and spread as easily as Omicron by Aaron Prater, November 1st. So what do they mean attack the lungs like Delta? Well, Delta was causing um, infections deeper in the lungs. And when things are in the lower lung, your lungs have different lobes and things. Um, things that get into your deep lung can be harder to overcome. There's just sort of less um, air going in and out of there versus, you know, the upper part of the lung or the rest of the respiratory tract. Um, Omicron was causing sort of like, uh, it was taking root in the upper lung and the upper part of like, uh, you know, space that you breathe through your nose and mouth and throat. But um, part of what made Delta so severe was that it was attacking the lower lung. But uh, Delta was also highly contagious, but not as much as Omicron. Now they're saying it's combining those two traits. So let's continue. Earlier this year, all eyes were on Deltacron, a Franken virus of sorts that combined Delta and Omicron, and potentially the worst traits of both. The initial strain reported in January failed to take flight. Reports of additional Delta-Omicron hybrids in multiple locations acro across the globe later emerged, then fizzled. But in the waning days of 2022, the Delta, Delta Cron phenomenon is back, if it ever left. This time, it's in the form of new COVID variants XBC, XAY, and XAW. So the X means that it is, um, uh, it's recombinant. So that's more than one strain has combined genetic material. Uh, this can be done artificially in a lab. It can also happen in your body. If a person gets infected with more than one strain at the same time, the virus can combine uh, genetic material. In a worst case scenario, a Delta Omicron hybrid could be as deadly as the Delta variant, which killed about 3.4% of those it infected, nearly double the fatality rate of Omicron, according to a 2022 study published in Nature Reviews Immunology. It could also feature the record-setting transmissibility of Omicron, which the transmissibility of Omicron now, it's higher than measles because each one of these new strains, it's like 20% more contagious than the last one. It just keeps gaining and gaining and gaining contagiousness. And let's also mention that talking about being as deadly as Delta. Now they're talking about Delta killed 3.4% of the people infected that's during that first two, three, or four weeks acute phase that we're talking about where it kills people by pneumonia, usually. But as we just reviewed in the last article, a lot of these newer, and some of the older too, um, strains also seem to be killing people outside the acute phase by just leaving them susceptible to a heart attack or whatever else. But they're talking about in addition to all of that long COVID organ damage related mortality that happens after the first month. They're also talking about this hybrid could increase the inside the first month acute mortality as well. Mortality is just death. Continuing, predicting the severity of such a strain is difficult because scientists aren't sure exactly why Omicron seems to cause less severe disease in many people when compared to Delta. XBC, a combination of Delta and Stealth Omicron BA2 circulating in Asian countries like the Philippines, has the greatest potential in the group for transmission. Variant tracker Raj Rajnarayanan. I should really get, uh, he's quoted in so many of these articles that name trips me up every time. I should really practice that. Assistant Dean of Research and Associate Professor at the New York Institute of Technology campus in Jonesboro, Arkansas, tells Fortune. It's been identified in the U.S., but only in seven cases so far, mainly from California. Because XBC contains the viral body of Delta, 
and the spike protein of Omicron. It's less likely to combine the easy transmissibility of Omicron with the deadly penchant of Delta to hide out in the lungs, experts say. So there's a couple of tweets, um, along with some brightness adjustment, um, going on there from Tom Peacock. The number of additional mutations combined with the usual parent lineages, i.e. Delta and BA2, which didn't ever co-circulate much in most places, leads us to hypothesis that these might have arisen from chronic co-infections, chronic Delta infection, possibly co-infected with BA2. And then there's another quick recombinant update, yet another chronicy looking complex Delta by BA2 recombinant, XBC, pretty low numbers still, but pretty similar looking to XAY, XBA, and XAW. So they're saying that um, somebody who had a chronic co-infection, somebody had both Delta and BA2 probably in their body for a long time, the uh, viruses, you know, got married and, um, well, we got XAB or whatever the hell they were just talking about. But they caution that scientists don't fully understand why COVID morphed from a lower respiratory disease in the days of and prior to Delta. Remember, Delta ended basically around December last year, so it hasn't been gone for long. Uh, to a less severe upper respiratory disease for many in the era of Omicron. But again, time out on less severe kills less people um, in the acute stage maybe from that pneumonia, but still causing massive long COVID damage, including death. The shift may involve changes outside the spike protein, which the virus uses to attach to and infect human cells. If so, it's anyone's best guess how future Deltacrons, even with Omicron spike proteins, will present in terms of symptoms. American Pi in the future, PI, like the Greek letter pi. Little is known about XBC, in including what its symptoms are. Scientists are aware, however, that the new variant has spawned additional variants, Raj Narayanan points out. Far less is known about XAY and XAW, first reported in South Africa and Russia, respectively. Other Deltacrons reported earlier this year, including XD in France and XS in the US, never took off, perhaps because they were less transmissible than, quote, stealth Omicron. Remember, these variants are constantly competing against each other. Whichever one spreads fastest is going to be most successful. Another tweet here from uh, Tom Peacock at Peacock Flu. Another few recombinant lineages got assigned yesterday as well. Here's the current list of unassigned BA1 by BA2 recombinants. Includes two more UK recombinants, XP, XQ, and XR, all spotted by at NZM 8QS. XP is interesting as it actually has the spike from BA1.1. And here's the list, Tom Peacock continues, uh, current list of notable Delta by Omicron BA1 recombinants. XS is the new addition from the USA. Uh, does rather look like these are mostly getting outcompeted by BA2 as far as we can tell. So this is from back in the spring, post Omicron, when we were looking at basically, you know, leftover shit from the winter, um, Delta and Omicron co-infection spawning these new variants. Regardless of how these Deltacrons play out this fall, there's always potential for another. While Delta is rarely reported these days, it's still being found in some places overseas like China. Just mentioned that. And persistent infections in immunocompromised people who may not be aware that they're immunocompromised or that they have a long-term infection may mean that Delta lives on undetected in patients worldwide. In animals, Delta variants with the potential to transmit back to the human population have been reported in more than half of US states, usually in deer and mink. We did a story at S4A on this uh, back in, Jan was it just January of this year? My God, it feels like it's been a long year. Uh, but yeah, we did a thing on that and it's theorized that the deer got it from uh, sewage runoff because again, you know, wastewater, um, some, uh, you know, virus is found in the wastewater. Anyway, while the bulk of Delta infections in animals have been detected in North America, they have also been reported in Lithuania, Switzerland, Hong Kong, Poland, Latvia, the Netherlands, Canada, South Africa, and additional countries. A combination of Delta and Omicron is, quote, not automatically worse, cautions Ryan Gregory, a professor of evolutionary biology at the University of Gulf in Ontario, Canada. 
Delta's ability to dodge the immune system, which pales in comparison to that of the latest Omicron strains, in combination with Omicron's severity, isn't an altogether horrible prospect. So, I mean, Omicron is so immune evasive now that some of the, um, actually most of the uh, monoclonal antibodies don't work against some of the new strains. So actually introducing Delta elements, who knows, could make them actually less immune evasive. But anyway, uh, it's not nearly as bad as that of a Delta Cron with Delta's severity and Omicron's transmissibility and Omicron's immune escape capabilities, he said. Because then you've got the heightened pneumonia causing of Delta and basically no way to handcuff this thing with antibodies. Scientists this fall are also keeping an eye on Delta strain AY103, which picked up some mutations present in some Omicron strains as it evolved in mink and deer. Such a variant, transmitted by the animals or immunocompromised patients it developed in, has the potential to be the next big thing in coronavirus evolution, the likes of which haven't been seen since Omicron burst onto the scene roughly a year ago. In other words, we've seen massive um, evolution and all these new strains emerging out of the Omicron family, but all these things, BA2, BA4, BA5, the BQs and everything that's come out of that, um, these are all Omicrons, basically. But they're saying that um, the, these Delta strains could sort of be the new Omicron family. So you'd have the whole Omicron family and the dozens of strains that it's generated and a completely new branch of this whole family tree running potentially at the same time. That's not great. By the way, why mention immunocompromised patients that these recombinants could develop in? Because immunocompromised people, the immune system is not going to be fighting it off as well. And so you can get, you know, just the strain circulating in there for months and months, replicating more potentially than it would in somebody with a stronger immune system. Hence, higher potential for recombination because it's hanging out in their body for longer. Quote, an American pie might, so that would be like the new variant of concern that finally gets a new letter, which really it should have already. Uh, an, an American pie might pop up like this, Rajnarayanan said, referring to the potential of AY103 or a similar strain of Delta, different enough from Omicron to be granted its own Greek letter name by the World Health Organization to rise to prominence. All right, that's all we got for COVID right now. As always, it's longer than I think it's going to be, but trying to, you know, pinch people, stop dreaming, COVID is not over, and uh, and so on. Let's catch up with the chat before we finish the Rent article and move on. Back on the Facebook thing, I do have to credit Facebook for really helping me radicalize. That was pretty cool. There's some ANCOM groups I remember fondly. Groups are literally all I use Facebook for anymore. Uh, and I have to tell you, um, a lot of the good groups got banned. I know because I watched them get banned. I was like, uh, there was a good one with AOC in the title. It wasn't like a, actually a pro AOC group, but it was like it was like a communist group that just had AOC in the title, and it got huge. It had like thirty-five thousand people in it, and it just got it just wasn't there one day. I keep being told, quote, if you want a uh, mask to work, you got to shave your beard and never grow in again. Um, yeah, so it is true that um, if you have a beard, it's going to interfere. You need an airtight seal on your face. However, the easiest way around that, and there's videos of this, if you look it up online, um, so I believe I first saw this from some kind of UK healthcare thing. Anyway, among uh, Sikh men, where that's, you know, I guess part of the custom is growing a beard and not shaving it. And they weren't firing the people for not shaving it. But what you do is, if you wanna wear a mask and not shave your beard, you get uh, some elastics. Like if you know those um, colored elastic stretch bands that some people use like for resistance training, like they look like huge rubber bands and they're like maybe three or four inches wide. Anyway, there's stuff you can get like that. And basically you, you like wrap it around your chin and it holds down your beard and it makes essentially a smooth surface that you can wear a mask over and 
you can have the beard, but you can push down the beard and still make an airtight seal. So there's videos about that, how to wear a beard with an N95 for like healthcare staff, and that works. So if somebody tries to run that bullshit on you, show them uh, that video. Of course, you got to find it first, but yeah. Yeah, it doesn't matter with a cloth mask, but cloth masks don't do shit anyway. You got to wear a, a N95 or KN95. But yeah, it is true um, that uh, your beard is going to interfere with that seal. It absolutely is. So um, yeah, you can do the thing where you just smooth your beard down basically with one of these elastics. My mom wears a standard mask. She feels uncomfortable wearing the KN95. Well, I don't, you know, which is more uncomfortable, the KN95 or fucking COVID, so. Uh, they just don't work as well. I mean, the cloth mask, surgical mask, they don't work nearly as well. So, yeah. The funny thing is I used to get deleted and banned in Twitch chats for saying that COVID causes brain damage because they're afraid of terms of service. Now you can tell the truth and not get nuked, but hardly anyone is real about the situation here. Yeah, there's, um, it cause it infects the brain and damages the brain. So that's just a statement of fact. I'm working in Phoenix and I go to multi-housing properties and all the leasing offices are out sick. All the residents have kids home sick. Everyone's hacking up a lung. It's ugly. I know it's anecdotal, but I'm looking at it. Yeah. And like I said the other day, if you go to Biobot, B-I-O-B-O-T dot I-O, click on the link, it'll take you to slash data. Uh, you can scroll down and look up your county. Uh, not every county is on there in the U.S., but many are. Huh. I just put a wireless mic and speaker on my Elastomeric Game Changer. Now that is... So using the GVS Ellipse P100. Yeah, I see that one get promoted a lot. I think that's out of the UK. There's um, other ones you can get that are like US based. So people talking about masks. Um, the Aura, 3M Aura 9205 Plus and 95. So somebody finds that the most comfortable to wear. I, you know, I've actually found some of the cheap um, like duckbill style. Those are some of the most lightweight and comfortable. There's other ones too. I think I tried the 9205. I just um, ordered a few and I think I got a box of the 9205s and I think they were pretty good. One of them, Harley, the Harley mask, I think it was L188. Oh my God, I don't know why they're recommended. They're awful. The fucking thing like goes up into your eyes practically at the top of the mask. I, I don't really get that. Anyway. It really sucks doing hard labor wearing a mask for a long time. Yeah, I mean, almost like um, trying to uh, trying to uh, get this virus under control so that people don't have to wear masks forever. That would be a good thing. I agree. Uh, another comment. I'm a nurse. COVID is still a thing, and RSV is out of control this year. Pediatric unit is full and overflowing into adult medical units. Scary stuff. Well, I feel for you. I understand a lot of healthcare workers quit after 2020. Um, just what they were seeing and wearing garbage bags for PPE and everything. And yeah, the RSV thing, it's like, oh, it's immunity debt. Well, how do you explain it in 2022? Because there hasn't been anything remotely resembling a lockdown for a long time. Well, you know, it's funny, talking about handling misinformation online, they were like real strict about certain things in 2020 and 2021. Now it's just complete, I mean, mask or vax itself, promoted by the Biden administration, is misinformation. So, you know, party of science, quote unquote, um, as I made the comparison many times, uh, you know, the Democrats just have their own style of science denial. You can see it with COVID. Republican Party denies, you know, outright that the virus is even real, some of them. And then uh, Democrats will just say, well, it can be controlled solely with the vaccine. Neither one is accurate. But it's like climate change. You know, Republicans, oh, it's a hoax. It's a Chinese hoax. And the Democrats are like, no, it's real. But we can, you know, sign on to like a 40-year plan to make incremental. No, you can't. So both are science denial um, that are not going to effectively solve the problem. But they have different styles of it.
Yeah, I mean, eating apples is good for you, but, um, yeah, I don't know about the COVID or whatever. Uh, let's see. I knew someone from a Discord server that got COVID five times. Unfortunately, that person is not probably going to have as long of a lifespan as they were going to have before getting that. Yeah, I feel the media should not be able to say that COVID is mild or mo milder, like it's literally almost killed 0.675% of the U.S. population. Uh, and who knows how many more will continue to like drop dead of a heart attack two or three months after getting it. Nobody makes the connection. COVID mismanagement in the U.S. and Canada is downright genocidal. There needs to be consequences. Um, yeah. All right. Wow. Uh, my local pharmacy stopped giving away N95 masks and even publicly and audibly shamed my family for wearing masks, saying they're just safety blankets. Um, I, yeah, I probably would have just walked right out. But um, that's terrible. Yeah, if I in that situation, if I had not walked right out, I probably would have been um, featured on a public meltdown compilation. So, I mean, it's just you run a pharmacy, but you don't have any idea about the basic public health science about masks, honestly. So it's COVID weakening immune systems that is helping RSV spread. We don't know. And that's the thing is all this stuff is novel situations. I think that that would be a decent hypothesis and uh, it should be studied and tested. We don't know. Like why was there a massive monkeypox spread in Europe and North America this year? That's unprecedented. Is it COVID related immune damage? Maybe. Is anyone studying this? I don't know. But we're seeing the resurgence of some diseases that are normally just not spreading the way that they are right now. My daughter got RSV around Halloween. She didn't have an appetite for a week, was constantly sleeping, coughing up a storm. It was really rough. I'm sorry to hear that. She bounced back, but she has since had a slight cough. So maybe ongoing lung damage. That's really bad. I'm glad she's better, but yeah. <laughs> uh, soon we're going to run out of Greek letters. Well, not if they just simply refuse to, um, you know, like we've been in Omicron for a year, even though we're at significantly different, you know, actual variants of the virus now. So what comes next? We don't know. That elastic on hair is pain, but thanks for the tip. Yeah, I don't know if it works or it doesn't, but that's what I mean. That's like formal policy, I guess, is like, all right, don't shave your beard, but at least just like clamp it down, basically. I mean, it looked like it would work. I'm part of a group on Facebook called Principles of Communism, originally meant to discuss theory. Out of that group, the group chat is honestly the most worth talking in. We have a lot of good discussions there. That's good to hear. Doesn't Rochelle Walensky have COVID again? Does she? I mean, she she had the the Biden. Let me look it up. Walensky COVID. I mean, pretty soon she keeps getting it. We're gonna see. It's like the how many licks to the center of the Tootsie Roll pop. Uh, how many, you know, COVID infections before you can't get any more COVID infections because, um, looks like she recovered finally. 
So she she had the Paxlovid bounce back. And uh, so basically you test positive for COVID, you take the Paxlovid antiviral, and then you test negative, and then you, it's like a five day course, and then you test positive again because the COVID bounces back. So she had that, so she had like some COVID on and off for two weeks, and I think she's finally, um, finally tested negative again. Yeah, she's the CDC fucking director. And this is this is who's leading the fucking COVID messaging. All right, good. Uh, there's a lot of good chat actually going on here about all this. I, I unfortunately don't have time to uh, read out all the comments, but um, good uh, good amount of chat actually going on the COVID. Let's finish up this article about the rent algorithm. So if you missed this yesterday in stream number 64, um, there's basically this company with this software. The company's called RealPage. Software is called Yieldstar, and it is potentially um, collusion, illegal, um, using a lot of private data for landlords to be jacking up rents all across the United States. It's causing huge surges in rent. And um, so check out that stream for part one. We're going to continue now. This is from ProPublica. Section is titled, Who Uses the Software and How It Works? Somewhere around 2016, according to one trade group, the industry's use of the pricing software began to achieve critical mass. So uh, just to recap again, I believe there's 32,000 property owners who use this now, some of them large corporations. The more property managers who sign on to real paid services, the more data flows into the company's repository. That in turn aids the accuracy of its pricing service, which the company says, quote, leverages multifamily's largest lease transaction database. So multifamily units meaning, and it's the largest lease transaction database of them. Okay. The more property I uh, read that RealPage's clients include some of the largest property managers in the country. Many favor cities where rent has been rising rapidly, according to a ProPublica analysis of five of the country's top 10 property managers as of 2020. All five use RealPage pricing software in at least some buildings, and together they control thousands of apartments in metro areas such as Denver, Nashville, Atlanta, and Seattle, where rents for a typical two-bedroom apartment rose 30% or more between 2014 and 2019. Graystar and FPI management each control hundreds of buildings in metro area. Oh, we read that. Um, No, we didn't. It's just a very similar sentence. Threw me off. Graystar and FPI management each control hundreds of buildings in metro areas where rents have risen steeply in recent years, and equity residential Lincoln Property Company and Mid-America Apartment Communities each manage dozens of buildings in high growth markets. In contrast, these same companies control fewer buildings in metro areas such as Philadelphia, Tampa, and Chicago, where rents have increased more slowly, the analysis found. Interesting. So rents increasing more slowly where these companies using the software are not found as much. Many factors may cause RealPage clients to cluster in high rent growth markets. The company's clients may gravitate towards such markets because those areas will bear more rent hikes and so offer an opportunity to make more money, for instance. But RealPage says its software steers pricing that beats the market in areas where it operates. RealPage's algorithm calculates how demand for apartments responds to changes in price, what's known as price elasticity. So how much change can the market bear in the prices? The algorithm, I mean, they're just literally trying to squeeze every last cent of possible rent increase out of the market using this high powered software. The algorithm takes into account characteristics of apartments like the number of bedrooms. It also considers factors such as how many more of a complex's apartments are likely to become available in the near future. Property managers can adjust settings according to their priorities, such as how full they want their buildings to be. The software also analyzes rent prices in the broader market, the company said. Those data can provide insight into how competitors' buildings located near the client, such as, say, within a half mile or mile radius, are being priced, said Ryan Kimura, a former RealPage executive. One advantage that RealPage's data warehouse had 
was its access to actual lease transactions, giving it the true rents paid instead of simply those a landlord advertised, RealPage said. Property managers can't look at the unpublished data any one rival is sharing with Yieldstar, Roper and other former RealPage employees said. Nicole Lott said that when the building where she worked as a property manager near Dallas started using Yieldstar, the software determined that similar buildings in the area were charging more. It pushed for steep rent increases. Quote, it really jumped rates up, Lott said. Leasing slowed down to a crawl. These people can't afford it, or they're just like, I don't want that, I'm going to keep looking. You know, I was mentioning my case, where I just couldn't find anything, I wound up staying. And, um... Not because I wanted to, especially, but because there just wasn't anything that I wouldn't be like, that I felt was even remotely the kind of deal where I wouldn't feel like I was getting screwed on a daily basis. Anyway, uh, so yeah, leasing slows down to a crawl. She and other staff challenged the software, asking the division of her property company that oversaw Yieldstar for a review, she said. The landlord ended up raising rates more gradually. Quote, we didn't think we could get those rates, she said. In some cases we were right, and in some cases we might have been wrong. Kimura, a former RealPage executive who worked at the firm for three years before leaving in 2021, said that the company would typically see pushback from property staff on about 10% to 20% of the software's recommendations. It was part of the process. Quote, if they're approving every rate and it's 100% acceptance, he said, they basically have a blindfold on and are pushing a button. RealPage claims that its software will increase revenue and decrease vacancies, but at times the company has appeared to urge apartment owners and managers to reduce supply while increasing price. During an earnings call in 2017, Wynn said that one large property company, which managed more than 40,000 units, learned it could make uh, more profit by operating at a lower occupancy level that, quote, would have made management uncomfortable before. So what does lower occupancy wind up meaning? Fewer people are getting the apartments. And, I don't know, does this coincide with the sort of explosion of homelessness? Yeah, probably. The company had been seeking occupancy levels of 97% or 98% in markets where it was a leader, Wynn said. But when it began using Yieldstar, managers saw that raising rents and leaving some apartments vacant made more money. Again, does it serve the people at all? No, it just serves the parasitical landlords. Quote, initially, it was very hard for executives to accept that they could operate at 94 or 96% and achieve a higher NOI by increasing rents, when said on the call, referring to net operating income. The company, quote, began utilizing RealPage to operate at 95% while seeing revenue increases of 3 to 4%. But the software supporters say it's not, of course they say this, it's not driving the nation's housing affordability problem. I mean, anyway. Though soaring rent is giving the industry a black eye, first of all, it's not a fucking industry. You're hoarding housing for profit. Like, housing is the industry. You're setting yourself up. You know, if housing was a right, there would be absolutely no fucking need for this at all. Anyway, uh, though soaring rent is giving the industry a black eye, Campo said, the culprit is a lot of demand and not enough supply. Yes, yeah, so weird. Um, people need places to live not revenue management software. The software just helps managers react to trends faster, he said. Okay, that's not true. So it, yes, it's true that um, housing is being built at the same rate, but there are more empty units than there are homeless people. So clearly there is just a money issue. There's a people being allowed to use the housing issue problem somewhere in the middle of this. And what's, let's say, okay. You have a situation where let's let's even say that supply is tight, you know, um, as far as having not enough supply, that's just frankly bullshit. Um, th there are homeless people. So, I mean, not homeless by choice. So this this isn't just like a, a supply issue, you know, a lot of demand and there's there's empty apartments and there's homeless people. So something is not happening here in the middle. Now, what's going to make that better and what's going to make that worse? Uh, making it easier for people to get in, such as, for example, making the apartments more affordable, raising, uh, or sorry, um, lowering the rent, things like that, lowering the amount of deposit that needs to be left, things like that. So we can talk about, is it making the overall situation better or worse? It's very clear here. 
when you're telling people leave more of your units unoccupied and raise the rents 20 percent yeah that's obviously going to exacerbate the problem and they're trying to liken it to just like it's just purely technology quote would you rather do your work today on a typewriter or on a computer he asked that's what revenue management is but we already talked about in earlier sections of this article it's just taking away any sort of um, negotiation between tenant and landlord uh, it's taking away that human element and uh, which you know wasn't always great in certain cases but sometimes the landlord would be like all right well you have you know a good rental history and you seem okay and i'd rather have like a good tenant for a longer period of time for like a hundred bucks less a month than you know having turnover every six months and like just gouging people it's kind of taking that element out of it so it's it's changing the whole nature of the the relationship here in in a sense or at least worsening it using software like yield star is quote taking what we used to do manually on a yellow pad this is just propaganda and calling people on the phone and putting it on a codified system where you take the errors out of the pricing oh the errors interesting real page seattle and rising rents to see how rent setting software can make a difference look no further than seattle where over the last few years rents have risen faster than almost anywhere in the country some studies show Large apartment buildings in one zip code just north of downtown, sandwiched between the Space Needle and Pike Place Market, are overwhelmingly controlled by RealPage clients, ProPublica found. The trendy Belltown neighborhood, with its live music venues and residential towers, had 9,066 market rate apartments and buildings with five or more units as of June, according to the data firm CoStar and Apartments.com. Property management was highly concentrated. The zip code's 10 biggest management firms ran 70% of units, data showed. So you got 10 companies controlling 70% of these 9,000 apartments. All 10 of them, so this is 70% of the market, is using the RealPage uh, YieldStar pricing software in at least some of their buildings, according to employees, press releases, and articles in trade publications. Expensive markets with high rents, like Seattle, tend to have, quote, very high rates of revenue management use by landlords, Roper said. Two buildings in the zip code, one with revenue management software and the other without, revealed diverging approaches to pricing apartments. The Fountain Court Apartments, 320 units clustered around a courtyard with a fountain, are about a half mile from Amazon's corporate headquarters. The building is owned and managed by Essex Property Trust, whose executives told investors in a 2008 earnings call that they were implementing YieldStar in the trust's apartment buildings. That's going to affect over 300 units. At the Fountain Court, rent has risen 42% since 2012, CoStar data shows, steeper than the 33% average increase for similar downtown buildings. So let's um, pause for a second. We can see that it's higher than the average increase could we say also that it may be driving it so we d have not established a causal relationship yet that's the first thing that popped into my mind in other words are other um, landlords seeing the rise in the prices of that apartment which what's the source yield star are they seeing that and then going oh well i'm going to raise mine too maybe not as like crazy high as they're doing it but is it dragging all the prices up very possibly. Tenant Amanda Tolup and her husband were approaching the end of their lease for a one bedroom at the six story building near the end of 2021 when they learned that rent would jump about $400 to $1,600. The increase amounted to 33% in one year. Tolup had been working as a barista and launching her own nutrition related business. Her husband worked for a bank. They expected their rent to go up, knowing that they had received a COVID deal, but the size of the jump along with other nuisances like stolen packages and noise from a nearby fire station, led them to look elsewhere. After finding prices similar to their raised rent at several other neighborhood buildings, the couple decided to leave the city entirely and move a half hour's drive north. A spokesperson for Essex declined to comment. None of the other biggest property managers commented on the record about their use of revenue management. A spokesperson for Essex declined to come. Oh, yep. Yeah, About six blocks away, rent has not, not gone up as dramatically at the Humphrey Apartments, a historic six-story brick building with 74 units. 
John Steppen, a writer for a tech company, moved into a studio in the 1923 building a little more than a year ago. It was small, but he liked the high ceilings, hardwood floors, and farmhouse-style kitchen. He had secured a COVID deal, too, one month free, with rent of $12.95 a month after that. A few months before his lease was up, the building notified him that rent would increase by $50, which amounted to a 3.9% rise. It was surprisingly low, said Stepan, who left only because he found a condo to buy nearby. Tammy Drugas, the asset manager who oversees the Humphrey and two other Seattle area buildings for the local real estate developer who owns them, said that she doesn't use a revenue management system. Quote, I don't believe in them, she said. That's great and fine for larger corporations, but I think it takes the humanity out of what we do. Now let's pause there. She's talking about being a landlord. So if you're taking what humanity exists in being a landlord out of it, what kind of fucking nightmare do you have left over? After 24 years in the industry, she said, she sees good relationships with tenants and vendors as the key to running a building successfully. She said that the Humphrey has low costs related to vacancies. The building's rent has barely budged in recent years, she acknowledged. Quote, we have a lot less turnover, and I feel like that keeps expenses down, Druga said. So that's another strategy. And according to them, they're doing fine. They don't need to be like, you know, looking at this uh, program telling them to like, you know, just keep squeezing and squeezing and squeezing. They're like, we'd rather have long term people and, um, you know, they might adjust the price for inflation. And uh, but they're not out to like literally squeeze every penny every second of the day that they possibly can. And, you know, it's a different approach. And it, like I said, uh, you know, being a landlord is being a landlord. But uh, literally, this yield star is like making it as wor the, the worst that it possibly can be. Seattle has been hit particularly hard by soaring rents. One report found the city had the steepest rent growth of any major city in the nation over the decade ending in 2019. So 2009 to 2019. Almost 46,000, uh, or I guess 2010, there we go. Almost 46,000 Seattle households were spending more than half their incomes on housing, making them what federal standards call severely cost burdened, according to a 2021 study that the city commissioned. Many families have trouble paying for necessities like food and medical care when their rent eats up 30% or more of their income. So yeah, this is if you try to buy a house, getting approved for a mortgage, a loan to buy a house, you have to show that your mortgage is only going to be like 30% of your income. And uh, otherwise, you're too likely to default. But nothing like this applies to um, to the rental situation. So people wind up paying like two thirds of their income in rent, and you can't even get into a house, you know, because uh, anyway, it's no one is talking about this as a serious political problem in this country. Uh, definitely not Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, so the three largest parties, nobody's even mentioning this. Quote, many others have been priced out of Seattle altogether due to rapidly rising rents and housing prices, the study said. It also found that people with higher incomes often down-rented, choosing cheaper apartments that would otherwise have been available to people making less. Seattle should have had a surplus of 9,000 apartments affordable to people making 80% or less of the median income, the study found. But tenants down-renting as prices rose turned that surplus into a deficit of 21,000. So literally 30,000 off. Why? Because people who could normally afford, quote, regular apartments no longer can because, quote, regular apartments now have insane rent. So they're going after, like, really low-rent stuff. And then the people who have absolutely no option but to get the really low-rent stuff have just absolutely nowhere to go. And nobody's to blame in this situation but the fucking landlords. Uh, so there's a chart here. Newly rent-burdened workers range from accountants to groundskeepers. In Metro Seattle, more people in a variety of jobs are spending over 30% of their income on rent. Below are the 10 occupations where the share of rent-burdened households jumped the most. So grounds maintenance workers were already the most rent burdened, and that went up to 76% from 55. Food service supervisors went from 45%, were rent burdened up to 65%. So there's growth everywhere. 
in, in uh, the percentage of rent burden people in different professions. As the availability of apartments has shrunk, so has the choice of landlords, because due to consolidation and ownership. The startling concentration of property management in Belltown mirrors a national trend. This is only going to get worse if there's another financial collapse, by the way, because fewer and fewer, fewer and fewer people will be left with money. Capital tends to consolidate over time. Uh, the number of apartments controlled by the country's 50 largest property managers has grown every year for 14 years, according to the National Multifamily Housing Council, which surveys buildings with five or more units. Those firms oversaw about one in six such apartments nationwide in 2019, amounting to 3.6 million units. By 2021, the number had risen to almost 4.2 million. James Nelson, a former bank examiner and loan broker, noticed the concentration of landlords when he and his partner moved to Seattle in 2018. Troubled by astronomical house sale prices and high rents, Nelson began looking at what was happening in the broader market. After some digging, he found that many, if not most, of the bigger apartment managers in Seattle appeared to be using price-setting software. Quote, the name RealPage kept popping up, said Nelson, who was retired and writing a book on his research. I went in and looked at the technologies that they were using. He concluded that the landlords were using tech to do exactly what RealPage advertised it could do, help them charge high rents and beat the market. Quote, there is no competition, he said. Again, I just want to highlight the lack of ability to, like the effect that this has on negotiation as well. Now the landlords are just, who are already this gigantic faceless corporation are going to just say, no, it's what the software said. Sorry, you know, suck it basically. Um, concerns about competition. RealPage's software has gained traction at a time when the Biden administration concerned, we'll put concerned in quotes there, about rising prices and corporate concentration no, he's not, is looking to bolster enforcement of rules meant to ensure that competition is flourishing. To win cases, and, and boy, is he really working overtime on that. You know, I'll tell you, I had to unsubscribe. My Twitter feed was just getting flooded with Biden, you know, taking action on like housing affordability and no. To win cases, antitrust prosecutors have traditionally needed to show that competitors agreed among themselves to tamper with pricing. What is the software if not that? Like, it might be mediated through the software, but that is literally why people fucking join. They are advertised that they can get the highest, most exorbitant rent possible. And effectively, the software is serving as a middleman to help them collude on that. What else is it but that? Anyway, quote, if competitors agreed among themselves to use the same algorithm and to share information among themselves with the purpose of stabilizing pricing, that would be per se illegal, said Stuck, the former antitrust prosecutor. If they simply shared information without agreeing to manipulate pricing, but that is literally the entire pitch of the software, the question of whether antitrust law was violated would be more complex, he said. Stuck said he knew of no cases where companies had been prosecuted for what's known as tacit collusion while using the same algorithm to set prices. But Maureen K. Olhausen, who was then the acting chair of the Federal Trade Commission, said in a 2017 talk that it could be problematic if a group of competitors all used the same outside firm's algorithm to maximize prices across a market. She suggested, this is funny, I read this part. She suggested substituting a guy named Bob everywhere the word algorithm appears. Is it okay for a guy named Bob to collect confidential price strategy information from all the participants in a market and then tell everybody how they should price? If it isn't okay for a guy named Bob to do it, then it probably isn't okay for an algorithm to do it either. Through a representative, Allhausen declined to comment on RealPage. RealPage's software raises multiple concerns, experts said. Courts have frowned on sharing non-public data among competitors. That's exactly what it is. Lease transaction data is not always public. So that would be sharing non-public uh, data. As far as RealPage's claim on its website that it uses, quote, disciplined analytics that balance supply and demand to maximize revenue growth, Stuck said that businesses can't usually control <laughs> supply and demand on their own. Yeah. Normally, that's left to market forces, he said. 
So, so, you know, stepping back, putting on our socialist hat here, more squarely on our head for a minute, uh, the whole, like, premise of capitalism is it's, you know, quote, fair because the market decides and this and that. Here, I mean, this is trying to break that system explicitly. That's what they're trying to do. And, you know, that is uh, frowned upon and illegal to varying extents within the system because, at least up to this point, you know, capitalism, they, there's this idea that, uh, you know, uh, millions will play, few will win. But it is fair in the sense of those who compete the best and are, you know, sort of fittest for the market environment will thrive. Well, if you get people just pooling this, you are just breaking that down directly. It's a direct assault on the thing that is not fair, but uh, it's, it's not fair enough. We could have a much fairer system in its place, but which is the the basis of whatever tiny scrap of fairness exists within capitalism's pricing system. They're even trying to squash that out. So the real page user group, the forum for apartment managers who use the company's products, encourages rivals to work together, something that has been challenged as anti-competitive in antitrust prosecutions too. The company's website says that the group aims to, quote, promote communication between users, among other things. Yes, and I suppose the cartels are just facilitating communication between users. Um, I mean, that is essentially what this boils down to here. It's, anyway, it's, I mean, it's amusing. I, I look forward to this getting, I and mean, the effects are anything but amusing, but I look forward to this getting uh, taken down one way or another. You know, and of course, uh, socialists want to, um, there's no need for most of this competition in the first place. But uh, if this is, we're also not for a for-profit system like this either. So we would take the competition out, but we'd also take the entire, you know, predatory, exploitative um, profit-seeking out as well. Continuing, starting out with 10 members in 2003, the group has grown to more than 1,000 participants, according to the website. A dozen subcommittees, including two focused on revenue management, meet in invitation-only sessions at the company's annual conference, Real World. Ironic and participate in a conference call each quarter. Those sorts of collaborations, Stuck said, could raise an antitrust red flag. If clients are tampering with market forces, their assertions in RealPage marketing videos that its software keeps prices and occupancy, quote, more stable, could also become relevant in court, Stuck said. Similar comments have been used as evidence in previous antitrust cases. And the exhortations by RealPage and real estate executives for companies to use Yieldstar and let some units sit vacant to raise prices are reminiscent of a legal case in the early 1900s, he said, where lumber companies shared information and a directive to reduce supply in order to push up prices. That's exactly what they're doing here. In an email to ProPublica, RealPage dismissed the notion that the company was using market data improperly. I mean, what are they going to do in a minute? The company said that using actual rents helps the company, quote, capture a truer picture of price elasticity and affordability, which reduces the odds that a unit is overpriced. Give me a break. And the least transaction data RealPage is using isn't always private. Sometimes such data is disclosed, the company said, such as when publicly traded real estate firms make reports. Yeah, but sometimes it is, and that's uh, not as good. The FTC, which has broad authority to bring enforcement cases against businesses for anti-competitive practices, said in 2021 that it was seeking a more active role in such cases. A spokesperson for the FTC declined to comment on RealPage's pricing software. The agency has tangled with RealPage before, in 2018, the company agreed to pay $3 million to settle an FTC complaint that the company had failed to do enough to make sure that personal information used in its tenant screening product was accurate. RealPage did not admit wrongdoing in the settlement. These people are, um, I mean, they're aggressive here and they're, they know what they're doing and they're not admitting to anything. This is not honest mistake territory if they ever do get caught. Higher rents are burdening more tenants. Well, yeah. Drown, <laughs> it's just like, okay, uh, yeah, I mean, does anyone have to be reminded of that? But drama over rent, rising rent costs, now a key driver of inflation. Let's read that again. Rising rent costs are now a key driver of inflation, has been increasingly public. The year before the pandemic, roughly 46% of renters in the U.S. spent more than 30% of their income on rent, and therefore met the definition of being cost burdened. 
Harvard University's Joint Center for Housing Studies found. In mid-September in Washington, D.C., angry protesters disrupted the normally sedate yearly conference held by the National Multifamily, uh, National Multifamily Housing Council. Let me just take a moment, and all of you out there, please applaud the angry protesters who had the foresight and took the initiative to storm and protest at the National Multifamily Housing Council. I say nobody's doing anything about this. Those protesters are, and we need a lot more like them. Before security ejected them, they seized the stage and recounted how their families had been harmed by an inability to find safe, affordable housing. At the center of the acrimonious debate has been Real Page's Jay Parsons. Since Real Page's own July conference, he's repeated a statistic compiled from a company data set of new lease transactions that market rate apartment renters are only spending about 23% of their income on rent. That's just bullshit. That's just complete bullshit. Um, the reality is that rents can only rise as incomes rise, Parsons told the New York Times last month. If people can't afford it, you can't lease it. But his sunny view has drawn sharp rebukes. This is demonstrably false, wrote Ben Teresa. Yeah, it is. Like, it's wrong on its face, wrote Ben Teresa, co-director of the RVA Eviction Lab, at Virginia Commonwealth University on Twitter. One of the defining characteristics of housing markets in the last 40 years has been rents increasing faster than wages. Quote, the problem is quite precisely that people are paying rents that they can't afford. That's the end of that article. Good job by ProPublica there. And um, so we got the RVA eviction lab. I'm going to write that down because... Um, there are a number of policy institutes at Virginia Commonwealth. Um, there are a number of uh, policy places that do, you know, research on homelessness. We covered one of those in the Michael Schellenberger video a while back, like back in the spring. And um, they produce a lot of reports and useful information that activists can and should use. This includes left political parties. And, you know, uh, storming the stage, that is one um, type of, uh, you know, protest and action. There's many others that can be used uh, to intertwine with all of this, and they should be used. You know, different types of actions are geared towards different types of results, um, and uh, people should remember that. All right, anyway, let's check in with the chat quickly, and then we're going to get into our first article on organizing the unemployed. Bit of a long stream today, but Doing three in a week doesn't work for me, so I got to cram it into the second one. All right. <laughs> when I left one of my old jobs, I added on the bottom of the closing checklist a tick box which said, Acknowledge that Mao did nothing wrong. Want to know something funny? Even Adam Smith, author of The Wealth of Nations, wrote in that book that landlords are parasites and should be abolished. I know places where rent went from 1500 to 3750 in one year's lease cycle for a one bedroom. That's what's going on in this and it's just it's mind blowing. This was not the case 10 years ago. It just wasn't. That, like it was it was starting to happen starting to happen 10 years ago it was just barely beginning um it's outrageous I, I don't know what else to say and it's like there's no brakes on this thing if, if we want to stop we have to apply the brakes ourselves we have to fabricate the brakes and then apply them while this train is running and it just it has to be done so if you're in a party organization whatever bring up the housing crisis and Start brainstorming actions because it's got to be done. Of course, if you're not, you know, if your uh, group isn't already doing something on it. My girlfriend and I got an apartment for 1025 back in 2019. It's a shitty two bedroom, but it was ours. Well, it was yours for a limited period of time, but yeah. She passed away back, I'm really sorry to hear that, back in March of 2021, and I just don't want to get a roommate, so now I pay 1200 on just my income. Uh, I'm really sorry to hear that. And, um, 
Yeah, that's the kind of real world situation that people are dealing with. Also, might I add, if you were to go get, uh, you know, a studio or something, it would probably be the same rent or more. So yeah, staying in the apartment, that probably makes a lot of sense. And um, yeah, I wouldn't want, you know, if I was in your situation, like you're living with your partner, replacing them with a roommate, um, especially probably with, you know, um, maybe wanting to hang on to memories of your partner and things. Yeah, getting a roommate in there would be probably the last thing a lot of people would want to do. It's getting bad here. It's a college town and all these damn lists of 10, base, 10 best places to live keep listing it. Um, pricing out the working class. Yeah, that's like, yeah, most livable, best places. Like, you see those lists pop up sometimes on, like, you know, MSN or something like that. And it's just like the death knell to people living in those places. Um, all of this is the Internet. You know, we're living in an age of much more information. And much more information with the ability to legally exploit things through capitalist practices is like just tightening the noose so fast, much faster than we're able to cope. And again, we need to see a lot more momentum in the left, like a lot. And now yesterday, homelessness is exploding all around the developed world, especially in big cities. Developed countries don't really have universal housing. Uh, yeah. I mean, the U.S., there's, there's a... Um, you know, the UN has various um, bills of human rights and things like that. There's like a political uh, bill of human rights and there's an economic one. I think they're, they go back to like the 70s or something. Anyway, um, the US, and even though these things are non-binding and toothless, the US is really big on um, political rights, like your right to vote for this or that or whatever. Um, but as far as economic rights, they just utterly refuse to recognize them. So the one that had the right to housing, the economic, Bill of Economic Rights, the U.S. still has not signed that, as far as I understand. Uh, they won't even, like, on paper, you know, s sign this toothless thing saying that housing is a human right. That is, that is how much they're opposed to it in relation, or how much more highly they value profit over, like, people having the basis of a decent life, stable housing. When I wanted to move out of my apartment, illegal dwelling basement studio run by a predatory slumlord firm that cost $1,300 monthly, which I found on Craigslist in New York, I was living on a razor's edge and wasn't ever able to go out to eat, rarely could even go out for drinks, told my landlord that I wanted to move out one September, oh, you wanted to move out on the 1st of September in March, but couldn't find anywhere by then, I had to leave the city. Yeah, that's... It's the housing market is beyond it's unfathomably bad and it's pretty much everywhere you look and the only places uh, I saw somebody on Twitter posting like housing listings from places like in the Rust Belt and it was like why are there houses here for fifty thousand dollars and it's like probably because it's a hundred miles from nowhere there's no jobs and the house itself is probably falling apart too. Uh, but like you want anything decent, it's like they want you to pay through the nose. The amount of greed is insane. Whatever the, you know, when they get their comeuppance collectively on all this, oh my God, like nothing will be too much. I don't have a car and I think that that's probably the only way I'm able to afford my place alone. I'd have to get a roommate if I ever started driving again. Yeah, so this is the choice. It's like, this is the choice people are making as like a grown adult taking on some stranger as a roommate or having a car. And uh, we live in a country that cars are not luxuries. They're like pretty essential in most places. Yeah, libertarians often pull the like, this isn't real capitalism. No, this is capitalism, period. No one really even disputes that, but like whiny libertarians. Call it really existing capitalism. Yeah, actually existing capitalism. I 
I need a car before I can even think of moving out from my parents' house. There's basically no public transport here. Congrats, you just described about 90% of the United States, minimum. Getting to perform in bands, I got to visit 30 countries and it really opened my eyes to just how badly, just how bad it, it really is in the States. Yep. Well, that's because um, car and oil slash gasoline companies have owned this country since World War II. Like, flat out just owned it. You look at the, who the biggest companies are um, in the U.S., like, since World War II, most of them have been, like... It's changed a little bit in the last 20 years with the Internet, but for most of it, oil and car companies. So, yeah. Um... They even want to stop the building of apartments unless they're, quote, luxury ones. Yeah, so that's gentrification. We talked about this in one of the homelessness articles um, that we covered. So we have a playlist on the housing crisis. It's in that video. And that's one of the leading causes of... So modern homelessness as we know it today did not always exist. Um, it's a product basically of the neoliberal era because there used to be... Uh, flop houses, also known as SROs, single room occupancies. Before that, if you've ever seen the movie Big with Tom Hanks, that like really shitty like one room apartment that he's uh, staying in uh, with like a shared bathroom, you know, it, it's better than living on the street and it's really cheap. But those got torn down, you know, most of them like by sometime in the 1980s to make room for, um, yeah, like luxury stuff that developers thought that they could get more money for. Uh, there's a couple of other factors, but it's mainly structural stuff. You know, conservatives will try to put this on things like mental illness or something like that. It, it really has nothing to do with that. Um, structural things, lack of social safety net when they started really cutting that um, in, in the neoliberal era. Also wage stagnation around the same time. But fundamentally, homelessness is a lack of affordable housing. We haven't really had this kind of situation until the neoliberal era of the past few decades. Yeah, your dad, how would, how would luxury apartments lower rent? Your dad's an idiot, at least on that issue. Yeah, so we covered this before too, how, uh, you know, somebody said, uh, unless you want nine roommates, you can't live anywhere. Well, some places are even trying to um, outlaw, at the same time that they're allowing rents to go through the roof, they're trying to outlaw co-housing. That was somewhere, I want to say in like Kansas or Oklahoma. And um, no, was it? It was Kansas City. That's what it was. Um, and uh, it just, the mind boggles. Yeah, I hear you on uh, living with the parents, um, seriously hindering your dating life. Yeah, it's, I mean, I think it is less stigmatized now, but I mean, just, I was just thinking, first of all, logistics. You just want privacy at a certain age, and uh, yeah, that can be very difficult, especially when, you know, a lot of people's parents now, if you're like in your mid-20s or whatever, um, you know, your parents lived through very different times, and if they're not aware of of uh how difficult it is today you know your parents might end up giving you a hard time you're like why don't you move out and you know or whatever else or just being passive passive aggressively um difficult with you about it i fully sympathize with that colorado proposition 123 sets aside tax revenue for affordable housing dedicates 0.1 percent of state income tax revenue for affordable housing including aid to develop more housing and assistance for certain renters and home buyers. Interesting. I mean, that could certainly be, you know, a lot more. Considering it is one of the basic needs of everyone, uh, a lot more could be put towards that. Bottom line, we need to decommodify housing. So, yeah. I 
I hate it when guys like Yanis Varoufakis talk about how since 2008 we have ended capitalism. Yeah, I must have missed that myself. Um, isn't isn't it just like a more extreme version of profit seeking on steroids because of technologies like these? Yeah, if he's saying we've ended capitalism, I don't know what the hell he's talking about. I mean, it's um, we're seeing a new thing with these corporate bailouts and all the pumping of money in. Like they are since 2008 managing the system in a new way. We may be, you know, sort of like um, before the emergence of finance capital, where financial capital started kind of swallowing up industrial capital, we may be seeing sort of a new stage even of that. I'm not, you know, I haven't done enough analysis to like make that claim solidly, but I mean, we're in a new phase, but it's definitely still capitalism. Huh, okay. Well, welcome. Somebody says, uh, I'm new to your channel. I've watched your YouTube videos. Got to say I agree with you. My parents come from Yugoslavia, so this isn't entirely foreign to me. They talk about how a lot of things were better back then than it is here in the States now. Yep. And, um, you know, even when more, um, uh, you know, the, when there was, um, there, there were more existing, what am I saying? I've been streaming for too long. Uh, I'm starting to lose the words, but, uh, you know, when the USSR existed, when Albania was socialist, you know, back in the days uh, before the late 70s in China, etc., when there was more of an actually existing world communist movement, there was a real counterweight to capitalism. There was an alternative to what, you know, was being done here. It kept the capitalists on their toes. Now that all that's been swept aside for the most part, they are just running, I mean, swinging for the fences on profit seeking and conditions are getting rapidly worse and worse. And yeah, of course, it's going to lead to a resurgence of, um, well, recognition of the need for socialism in the first place. So, yeah, that's why we're doing this. Um, whatever the case, you know, people have different opinions on uh, the revolutionary potential of the United States. I think regardless, we can make the U.S. left a lot better if we, you know, if we hit socialist revolution, great. Um, but at a minimum, the U.S. left needs to be much more anti-fascist, more internationalist, anti-imperialist than it is now. And we're, you know, whether we end up at revolution uh, before many other countries or not, we at least have to do those things because the U.S. left is chauvinist and anti-communist and, you know, kind of insular. And um, anyway, so the U.S. left needs a lot of improvement wherever we end up. And that's a lot of the, uh, the effort here. So before we um, sign off for today, I'm going longer than usual, but um, I've been talking about these uh, Organizing the Unemployed articles for a while. I have two of them. Let's jump in, cover at least one of them because I've been mentioning this for so long, I've had these sitting around for three weeks too. So this is from uh, Descent Magazine, Organizing the Unemployed by Sam Adler Bell. And this is actually from last winter, but it doesn't really matter because this is kind of a perennial issue and it doesn't, you know, it's not a current event as far as like uh, changing dramatically in principle from year to year. So anyway, Organizing the Unemployed, a replicable strategy for organizing the jobless on a mass scale has yet to emerge. The future may depend on finding one. At the beginning of November, a million Americans filed new unemployment claims within a single week. So this was last November. Over 20 million were already receiving benefits. While the unemployment rate came down to 6.9% in October, that figure elides those who've dropped out of the labor force altogether. Indeed, many job losses considered temporary in the spring have been reclassified as permanent. At the time of writing, 13 million Americans stood to lose unemployment benefits they'd been receiving through the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, PUA, and the Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Programs the day after Christmas. Sweet timing. For many households, these emergency programs were their last remaining sources of income. Their expiration is devastating. As an unemployed Tennessee restaurant manager told the New York Times, without it, I'm dead in the water. 
These conditions have inspired an old refrain, we must organize the unemployed. It's familiar to any leftist who has lived through multiple recessions. In such times, we tend to look back, nostalgically, to the communist and socialist-led unemployment councils of the 1930s. The scale and militancy of these movements, however brief their flourishing, make them an appealing touchstone for organizers reckoning with a comparable system-wide failure today. But in many ways, the model is an awkward fit for our times. Depression-era unemployed organizing took place in a pre-welfare state environment. Unemployment insurance, UI, itself was one of their key demands. The jobless today face degraded but still extant existing versions of their, uh, sorry, but still extant versions of social programs whose inauguration the unemployment councils set in motion. So they're saying that, um, you know, they're able to organize conditions were worse and they demanded, you know, setting up unemployment insurance. Now it's like, well, there's still some remnants of this left. So you get into this whole debate over like, well, is it necessary? We already have the program. Well, obviously the program isn't really cutting it. So, yeah. Uh, their legacy, the unemployment councils, are semi-functional UI system and the extra benefits included in the CARES Act cushioned the American working class during the harshest months of 2020. Indeed, overall poverty rates went down during the spring thanks to stimulus provisions. And yet millions of families are now looking down the barrel of a winter without income, their lives pummeled by eviction, hunger, and despair, while another deadly coronavirus wave leads to more lockdowns. Well, um, that's not the case, but many people are just out of the labor force at this point, this year versus last year. Mobilizing the unemployed, and again, lockdowns in the U.S., not, not really so much. Mobilizing the unemployed to demand an adequate fiscal response from her desultory federal mandarins, it's a bit overwritten, is imperative. Americans will be fighting for their lives no matter what. The question is whether they will be fighting together, in solidarity, and thus with a chance to win. The end of the pandemic glimmers on the horizon. No, it doesn't. I think we've established that pretty thoroughly. But there is no vaccine for a jobless economy. As Aaron Beninav recently argued in these pages, A World Without Work, Fall 2020, unemployment and underemployment will likely remain a structural feature of our economy long after the virus subsides. Decoupling economic survival from private sector employment is not merely an emergency necessity then, but the struggle of our lifetime. As of yet, no replicable strategy for organizing the jobless on a mass scale has emerged. The future may depend on finding one. While the history of America's most powerful unemployed movement does not offer a blueprint, it's a decent place to start. Bringing misery out of hiding. At the onset of the Great Depression, socialists, communists, and followers of the minister-turned-Marxist, A.J. Must, organized groups of unemployed workers to demand relief paid for by employers and the state. The unemployed councils of the Communist Party, which boasted the largest membership by far, again, this is you know, the days when CPUSA was really making major strides forward, um, have been memorialized on the left as a model of militancy, strategy, and radical leadership. Precise membership figures are difficult to estimate, but hundreds of thousands pass through the party's unemployed councils. Communist cadre organized the jobless by block and by tenement, meeting them in the breadlines, flop houses, and local relief centers where they congregated as the economic crisis worsened. On March 6, 1930, when communists worldwide called for marches of the unemployed, the councils mobilized over a million jobless Americans to march on city halls and state capitals. The communists brought misery out of hiding in the workers' neighborhoods, recalled labor radical and future CIO leader Len Decoe. CIO is the Congress of Industrial Organizations. It was kind of a slightly less radical IWW, also did industrial unionism. However, after um, McCarthyism and the Red Scare and all that shit after World War II, CIO got wiped out and uh, basically decimated and then swallowed up by AFL. That's why it's now today AFL-CIO or CIA, as some people call it. The early CIO was pretty good. Um, they paraded it with angry demands through the streets. Through a combination of mass mobilization and local militancy, the UCs got results. 
In Chicago, a demonstration organized by socialists and communists, tens of thousands strong, was sufficiently fearsome to inspire city and state officials to borrow $6.3 million from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to meet the marchers' demands. Justifying the concession, Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak said, I say to the men who object to this public relief, because it will add to the tax burden on their property, just talking about that with the unions before, they should be glad to pay for it, for it is the best way of ensuring that they keep their property. We're going to pause right there. That is pretty much the slogan of the New Deal, is um, pay for these social programs with a little bit of your money now to preserve the rest of your money later. So while these reforms were demanded in the short term by actual radicals, it was understood by the ruling class basically as a way of um, you know throwing the workers a bone to kind of keep them off the scent and try to preserve capitalism. That is, in this case, uh, what actually happened. So, and it's funny because when we were talking about this before with the unions, it was specifically around the issue of um, public teachers demanding affordable housing. So we've come like full circle back to where we were early here, at, down to the objections over the uh, taxes, except now the attitude is no longer, well, let's throw them a bone so that we can hang on to our system. Their thing is we've got Yieldstar, we've got you know Google, we've got all this like crushing technology. Let's just dig in and go for just basically techno-fascism instead. No, gone is that sort of concessionist um, tone, by and large, of the ruling class. Instead, they have replaced the social democratic consensus among the capitalists uh, with the neoliberal consensus that started coming in in the 70s, by the 1980s with Ronald Reagan, and, you know, some say Jimmy Carter too. Reagan, I would say, was like the corporate candidate. It was like, Reagan's new vision was full-on neoliberalism, uh, libertarianism, if you will. Um, and, uh, you know, it was like, no, we don't need to make concessions anymore. We're hardline capitalists, and we're going to dig in and basically just fuck people over uh, using all these tools at our disposal. We're going to pause it there for today. Uh, we're just about a third of the way through the article. But I thought that was a decent place to leave off and give some food for thought. A teaser, I guess. I meant for it to be more than that, but we will pick up with this. I wanted to at least start it today. Uh, again, food for thought, and it's going to lock us into making sure that we finish this in the next stream, probably next week. So um, I'm going to head back into the chat for a minute. Let's also take a minute to thank the patrons whose names are on the screen. We'll stay on the screen for the remainder of the stream here. And um, yeah, I appreciate everybody dropping in uh, to the chat. There was some really good stuff written. I wasn't able, due to time constraints, to read it all out on the stream. But, um, you know, you all listening to this and contributing to it help to make the streams what they are, also to people listening on YouTube after the fact and uh, helping us spread this information on social media. Like, share, subscribe, because that helps YouTube to uh, recommend this content to more people course, patreon.com slash socialism for all. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, as I say, I would make content even if nobody supported uh, financially, but the financial support allows me to spend a lot more time on it. All right, with that, um, I'm going to sign out and you'll see some more content soon, but until then, take care of each other.